What's up Chaos Shinobi here. This is what if Naruto is overpowered early. Summary, what if Mizuki tries to trick Naruto several years earlier, unlocking a seal, unleashing Naruto's full potential, and his inheritance. Chapter 1, Learning the Truth. Naruto Age, 7, Night of the First Year Exam, Forest of Konoha. Cage Bunshine no Jutsu. Several hundred clones appeared in the forest was covered in a sea of orange jumpsuits and bright yellow hair. Iruka and Mizuki sweated at seeing so many shadow clones. Before the clones descended upon Mizuki in a huge mass. Twelve minutes later the clones had all dispelled and only Iruka, the original Naruto and a now severely beaten and bruised, unconscious Mizuki remained in the clearing. There were a few moments of silence, before Naruto collapsed, orangey red chakra flickering around his body and began to scream in agony. Sarutobi Hiruzen, the son Daime Hokage of Kanahagakur no Sato, was watching the scenario through his crystal ball, Anbu on hand to intervene if necessary. However, when he saw the red chakra that was beginning to cover Naruto, he immediately shunshined to the area. Arriving at the scene, he ordered two of his Anbu to take Iruka to the hospital and Mizuki to the Tiana department, the others setting up a perimeter around the clearing. The son Daime then tried to touch Naruto in order for him to try and assess his condition but when his hand got closed the red chakra leapt towards it burning it slightly. The son Daime sighed heavily, rose, and upon sending an Anbu to gather some of his most trusted Anbu, resealed the scroll of seals and settled down for a long wait. In Naruto's mindscape, all of a sudden Naruto felt cold water, but none of the blinding pain that he had felt moments before. He quickly stood up and realized that he was standing what looked to be a sewer-like structure. How the hell did I get in here? He thought, utterly bewildered. He looked around for some sort of way out, and saw that there were three huge pipes hanging from the darkness above him. The one on the left was dark silver, almost gray, the middle was black with streaks of red flowing through it, and the third, on his right, was a bright pulsating red. Slightly unnerved by the last one, but figuring that he didn't have any other ideas on where to go, he followed the pipes into the gloom. Naruto soon arrived at a rather large open space and as he moved further into the gloom he quickly came upon what looked to a series of huge vertical columns, continuing on further than he could see on either side of him. On the column directly in front of him was a large piece of paper with the kanji for seal on it. However what intrigued Naruto was not the meaning of the huge columns but what he could see on the other side of them. There were two women, both seated on a couch watching a television screen. They both looked almost exactly the same, both had flowing red hair and were clearly women who had seen battle. However the second woman had two major visible differences compared to the first woman, in that she possessed nine foxtails and had a pair of fox ears on the top of her head. Who are you? The words leapt unbidden from Naruto's mouth before he could stop them. Both females looked up, the first in utter glee and excitement, the second in slight anguish and sorrow, but with both there was a vague feeling of apprehension. Naruto immediately started to cringe, now that he had drawn attention to himself. There was no way he could leave unharmed. Narukun. The first woman had leapt up and was rapidly approaching Naruto, arms out wide, in a way that reminded Naruto of various people who caught him in order to let the others beat him. Naruto immediately backed away, trying to get away from the two women. The woman, seeing this, slowed to a stop, before tentatively reaching for Naruto's shoulder, and holding it gently. Once Naruto realized that the woman was not trying to harm him, he looked up and repeated his question in a hopeful tone. Kushina was trying her best not to exude killing intent at the way her son reacted to the presence of another person. I knew that they hated him, she thought. But obviously it has gotten worse over the years, to the point where he shuns human contact, what did they do to him? As she gently wrapped Naruto in a hug, she answered his initial question. Naruto, I am your mother Uzumaki Kushina, heiress of the Uzumaki clan, and Konoha's Red Death. The other woman over there is Kyare, although she is better known by her title, Kyubi no Yoko. But didn't the Yondame kill the Kyubi seven years ago? Naruto asked, understandably confused. Naruto, Kyare is a baiju, and the greatest of the tailed beasts, it is impossible for anything less than the gods themselves to permanently kill a baiju. -o. If she did die then she would just spend a period of time out of this world before coming back, so the Yondame resorted to the last thing any parent would do. He sealed it within his son, Kushina explained patiently, thinking that Naruto knew of his father at least. So. If she was sealed within the Yondaime's son, then where is he and why is she in a sewer? Naruto asked, not having made the connection. Naruto, this is no sewer, we are within your mindscape. The second woman, Kyare, spoke up suddenly, seeing that Kushina was having difficulty saying it. But, if we are within my mind, then that means the Kyubi was, sealed. Within. Me, Naruto said, utterly relieved to finally know the truth behind why he was treated so horribly. 
It took a few seconds before the full import of his mother's words hit him, Wait, do you mean that I am the son of the Yondaime? Naruto shouted, absolutely aghast with shock. Yeah, you're Minato and my son. Kushina exclaimed with glee. Why did no one tell me this? Naruto asked slightly hurt that his Gigi, the son Daime, had lied to him about his parentage. Well I knew that it was necessary for your parentage and your ancestry to be hidden from the general populace, otherwise you would have had so many assassination attempts on your life, as Minato and I made plenty of enemies during the last Shinobi War, but I thought that you would know. When you meet Hiruzen can you ask him to come into the mindscape so I can beat the crap out of him for hiding everything from you? Kushina asked with a manic look in her eyes. Hold on what do you mean my parentage and my ancestry? I can understand the parentage part, but do you mean to say that I am related to other great figures of history? Naruto asked in a joking manner. Yep, on my side your grandfather was Uchiha Madara, relating you to both the Uchiha and Uzumaki, and your father, and therefore you, was a direct descendant of the Sanju, with both the Sha Daim and Nidaim Hokages being your great-grandfather and great-granduncle respectively. You also inherited the bloodline of each family. Kushina listed casually, examining her fingernails. Naruto did the best thing he could upon learning his ancestry and the fact he had bloodlines, he fainted. Waking up 15 minutes later, Naruto took several seconds to remember his conversation with his mother before he fainted. It's completely mind-blowing, he thought, to think that barely six hours ago I was trying not to let my mask slip in front of the rest of the class when I failed the first year exam, and now I have met my mother in the QB learned of my heritage and been told that I am directly descended from three of the Hokages. Kushina and Kyare, seeing that Naruto had woken up, paused the recording that was on the television screen and moved towards him. Naruto, seeing the QB in human form coming towards him, was decidedly curious about the being. He knew that just because it looked like a girl, doesn't mean it necessarily was one. So considered how you have acted since I came here, I get the feeling that you aren't exactly the insane, bloodthirsty demon you're made out to be, are you? Naruto asked, abruptly getting straight to the heart of the matter. Well, no I'm not. We Baiju are almost exactly like humans except that we are immortal, use Yuki and have several different forms, Kyari summarized tentatively, before continuing, I also wish to apologize to you, seeing as I was the cause of your father's death. Before we get round to that, can you perhaps explain to me why you attacked Konoha in the first place? Naruto asked, eyes piercing. To do that we will need to start it at the founding of Konoha. At the battle at the valley of the end between Senju Hashirama, Uchiha Madara, and an unknown assailant that managed to match both of them at once. The truth is that Hashirama and Madara were actually the best of friends, and as much brothers as Hashirama was with Doberama, his biological brother. However due to the power that Madara had gained the Uchiha clan elders tried to blackmail Madara into betraying and destroying the Senju, but Madara refused, and was forced to flee. Hearing the rumors that the Uchiha elders had spread, Hashirama killed them in his fury and went after Madara. Together they met before a man wearing a circular orange mask interrupted them, and together they fought against him. In the battle Madara summoned me to help them fight, but the unknown man had a method with which to control me, yet I am still unable to fathom as to what that is. Uzumaki Mito, who had followed her husband, saw me about to be turned against Madara and Hashirama, and using her skills at Fu and Jutsu, sealed me into herself. All three of them survived the battle with the man. Although both Hashirama and Madara were left as merely shadows of their former selves, Madara went into hiding, thinking that the man would come after him and not being able to return to Konoha, and settled down. The woman he married about five years later was an Uzumaki, as both the Uzumaki and Senju clans knew the truth of what happened on that day. This woman, Uzumaki Kirina, eventually gave birth to your mother 13 years later. Both Madara and Kirina were able to take on the cage and defeat them easily even though Madara never quite regained his former strength. Raising your mother in Rizushio Gakur no Sato, village hidden in the whirlpools, and the Uzumaki clan home, she was a prodigy that had never been seen before, only later being surpassed in her earlier years by the Yondame Hokage, Uchiha Itachi, and Hatake Kakashi. However, when she was eight, a combined force of Iwa and Kumonin attacked Ozushio. Both of your grandparents fell in the battle for the village, which lasted for two weeks before it ceased. The attackers had been decimated, barely any of them survived, but the only survivor of the attack was your mother, Kyare reminisced. Kushina then took up the story. I traveled to Konoha, seeing that we were allied with it at the time, and carried the secrets of Azushio with me. The instructions on our secret ninjutsu techniques, our use of fu ninjutsu, and the scroll for our kenjutsu styles, most of which rank among the deadliest styles known. When I arrived there it seemed a person or persons within Konoha saw this as an opportunity to gain power and poisoned Uzumaki Mito, 
who had outlived the majority of her generation. Over the next four years Mito was dying from the poison within her body, the only thing slowing it was her skill with Fu and Jutsu. Over these years she taught me everything she knew, especially Fu and Jutsu and Kenjutsu, to the point where my ceiling was beginning to rival hers and I had become the foremost Kenjutsu student within the village. She also taught me politics and economics, even Jutsu creation. Then she died, but before she did Kyari was passed on to me, as only the Uchiha, Senju or Uzumaki can control the power of Kyari. Uchiha through their eyes, Senju through Makuten, although only Shotaim had the necessary affinities. The Uzumaki are able to control Kyare's chakra either through using their own, seals, or using an ability that all Uzumaki can learn called chakra chains. Thus it makes sense that we would be the ones to carry Kyare. Okay, so I know how I am related to the Uchiha, but how am I related to the Senju, specifically to the Shotaim and Nidaim, through Dad? Well, no one knows. But it is presumed that Minato's father was probably the son or grandson of the Shah Daim, who died sometime during the gap between the Second and Third Shinobi Wars. After the Second Shinobi War he simply disappeared off the map. Kushina answered in a rather annoyed tone. Okay, Naruto said brightly before quieting once again. Both Kushina and Kyari simply waited, as they knew that Naruto would be in the middle of some heavy thinking right now, and would eventually have more questions to ask. The silence continued for about five minutes before Naruto spoke up once more. A, hey, Kachan, Naruto started tentatively, if I am related to the Senju and Uchiha clans, wouldn't that mean I would have their bloodlines? I was wondering when you would get around to asking that Naruto, Kushina smiled at her son, as the answer to that is yes. In fact you have three bloodlines. What? Naruto was actually asking the question to try and dispute the fact that he was related to all these legendary people. But this made his mind crash to a halt. You have three bloodlines, Kushina repeated, you have the Sharingan, the Uchiha bloodline from me. Kushina demonstrated, activating her own three Tomoe Sharingan. You have large amounts of highly efficient chakra, allowing you to spam high level jutsus and have an insanely increased lifespan. This even allows us to create solid things purely from chakra, from Shuriken and Kunai too, if one has enough chakra, even a house. The final bloodline you inherited is from the Senju and is the only known skill bloodline. Usually bloodlines are categorized into three sections, Dujutsus, Chakra bloodlines, and Body bloodlines. However the Senju bloodline is none of these, although it is heavily related to a Chakra bloodline. The Senju bloodline allows a member to completely master and take the field of Ninjutsu that they study to unprecedented heights. For example, the Shadaim chose elemental Ninjutsu to master and took his earth and water affinities to the point where he could combine them into his legendary Makuten while his brother also chose elemental ninjutsu, he only had a water affinity but completely mastered the essence of water. Your father chose space-time ninjutsu, but was also very good at chakra manipulation, while Tsunade of the Senen specializes in medical ninjutsu. Naruto's mind was in complete and utter shock at the thought of having such great bloodlines. With all of these three bloodlines alone, Naruto has the potential to be the greatest shinobi in history, discounting the Rikudo Senen. Both Kushina and Kyari had these thoughts running through their heads. Wait a minute, Naruto spoke up once more, if I had these bloodlines, wouldn't someone have noticed by now, or something happen? Ordinarily that would have been the case, especially with your Uzumaki and Uchiha bloodlines, but that damn seal that was on your back delayed the onset of your bloodlines and limited your capabilities to being pathetically weak. It even blocked off more than half of your brain's cognitive capabilities, Kushina answered in a disgusted tone. Is there any way we can get it off from here? Naruto knew there was no point panicking. We've already taken it off, that's what the pain was when you passed out. It was a real bug or two. Kushina consoled understandingly, there no way she would want an unknown seal on her either. It seems we have strayed a bit off topic on how I came to be sealed within Naruto, Kyare. It seems was a bit impatient to explain the truth to Naruto. So we have, while well, you can finish the story, as it is more about you and I can explain more about myself to Naruto later. Kushina acquiesced to Kyari's request. After Mito died I was sealed within your mother, as she and the Senju agreed it may have been best to keep it from the Uchiha, whose ties with the Senju were starting to fray. Once I was sealed within Kushina, we became very good friends with each other, as I had with Mito. Skipping forward to the night of your birth, Kushina was in labor when a masked man assassinated the guards around the area, this masked man revealed himself to Minato and Kushina. He used you as blackmail to leave Kushina facing him alone while your father was getting you to safety. This was more than enough time for the masked man to defeat and constrain her, and he began to pull me out of her body. Once he had he controlled me and forced me to attack Konoha, your father resorted to using Fuu and Jutsu that he had devised to seal me within you. The seal he devised was the only of its kind, 
as it is slowly taking my yuki, and transforming into your chakra, thus constantly increasing your chakra reserves. But the reason I explained earlier about the battle at the valley of the end was because the masked man wore the exact same mask as that man did, so obviously it is either the same man or some organization. Kyare looked down before continuing, it was due to me that you lost any chance of having a father, so I beg for your forgiveness. There was a moment of silence following these words as Kushina had lost the ability to speak and Naruto was perplexed as to why she would ask for such a thing, Kyare chan there is no need for you to ask for forgiveness as you did not have a choice in attacking Konoha, the masked man is to blame for my father's death and the destruction it wrought on Konoha. Naruto said, hugging the demon in human form. Kyare began crying as she hugged Naruto before smiling. Naruto, I promise I shall help you to the best of my abilities in whatever endeavor you make as long as it is involved in fighting or training. Naruto was shocked that Kyare had made such promise to him. However before he could respond he felt a tug, trying to draw him from his mindscape. Well it seems they are trying to wake you up Naruto. Okay when you wake up tell the Sandaime that you know the full truth about your heritage, parents and Kyare, he should know what to do. Also, know that the seal is gone we shall be able to speak to you while you are conscious, and ask if you can bring him and those he trusts and like you into the mindscape to make it easier to explain things, Kushina said in a rush as Naruto began fading back to the conscious world. Konoha Hospital one and a half hours later in real world. Vibrant blue eyes blarely opened to see the masked face of the dog Anbu shaking him softly in desperation. A few moments later the Anbu stopped, seeing that Naruto's eyes had opened, and stepped back silently. Naruto glanced around what seemed to be his bed within the hospital to see the Hokage, and dog, cat, snake, raven, weasel and turtle masked Anbu gathered around his bed. The Hokage, Seeing Dog step back realized that Naruto had woken up and moved swiftly over to him. Naruto, I must know what happened, Hiruzen said in a rather stern tone. Jigi, I need to talk to you in private with those you trust and like me, which are probably only the six Anbu that are here, Naruto said quietly. The six Anbu pricked up at this news. Before Kat ended up asking the question, how were you able to tell we were there? There's no way you should have known. I don't know how I knew, I just did. It was like there was a an energy that I could sense within each of you, Naruto explained apprehensively. Ah, so it seems Naruto is a sensor ninja, Hiruzen thought with slight wonderment. Well, then, can you tell us if there are people eavesdropping on us? The Hokage asked, although he was also checking with Snake, who also had a similar sort of ability. Naruto was quiet for a moment, before speaking up. Jigi, he said quietly, there is someone using chakra two windows down and directing the chakra to this room. Immediately two of the Anbu, Raven and Weasel, disappeared in blurs of speed. The Hokage, Anbu and Naruto heard the sounds of a light scuffle before they reappeared within a man, bound and unconscious between them. The Hokage, seeing the root insignia on the man's blank mask, immediately ordered Kat to send for Inoiki, the best of the Yamanaka mine walkers, and head to the Yamanaka clan. After Kat had disappeared with a shunshine, he ordered Raven, Dog and Snake to stay with Naruto before he, Weasel and Turtle shunshined away as well. Before long Naruto was fast asleep and the three remaining Anbu had dispersed themselves around the room. As Raven watched over the sleeping child she considered what to get Naruto for his birthday in a few weeks time, as October the 10th was rapidly approaching, but she and the Anbu guarding Naruto knew what a dangerous situation Naruto's birthdays were, so they got him presents a few weeks early. She, along with Snake and Weasel were setting the date to give Naruto presents as September the 29th while Cat, Dog and Turtle were setting theirs for the 30th, a mere day later. Any later and it was October, the month where Naruto spent most of his time hiding out and scrounging for food, although the majority of the Anbu tried their best to help him, even giving rooms for the night. As Raven listened to the sounds of merchants plying their trades in the market, she realized that it was almost time for the traders to return to Konoha, as they came on a seasonal basis. Knowing that the traders adored Naruto for his sweet attitude, she came to the conclusion that she would be able to get Naruto something good and unusual, at the same time as making a bargain as they lowered the prices of their wares for Naruto. In fact, if she could get Naruto to come along with her and browse the wares for what he wanted himself. Conveying her plan to Dog and Snake through hand signals, they had to admit it was a good plan, and made a note to inform the others when they returned. Around half an hour later and informed the Anbu of their results with the root member, Inoiki had walked through his mindscape and found evidence of some of Donzo's dealings. They then had formulated an infiltration which revolved around Dog putting a hidden tracking seal on the man and erasing the man's memories of his capture and inserting false information. This was done to make it seem that there was only normal things that involved Naruto and allowed them to find Donzo's root bases within the city. 
Hiruzen took this precaution, as Donzo had always been highly interested in possessing Naruto in order to turn him into one of his mindless automatons and gaining more power behind him. As he considered this he was overcome by anger at how far Konoha had descended from its original values and swore that it was time to regain control over the city. As the Anba listened to their Hokage, they could see quite clearly that the Kami no Shinobi was back. Early next morning, Hokage's office. Hiruzen frowned as he sent away two Umbu teams to send for his two students Jiraiya and Tsunade, to come back to Konoha immediately, even authorizing his Anbu the use of deadly force in order to retrieve them. He was planning to get them back into Konoha to replace his current advisors, as he knew that the council elders were the source of him losing most of his power after Minato died. After the goal was completed he was going to slowly regain most of his power, as with Tsunade and Jiraiya as his advisors he would have their support, and he would be able to rebuild Konoha to its former glory. His main concerns were the number of secrets held within Konoha, the running of the academy, and the descent of the hospital, along with the loss of many shinobi that specialized in areas outside of Taijutsu, Ninjutsu, and Genjutsu. He was also going to go over many of the laws regarding the shinobi bloodline clans, especially if they were down to their last few members, such as the Yuki clan survivors that teams of Anbu and Naruto had retrieved from the Kiri bloodline purge, along with other such clans. After scribbling down some ideas for the adjustments he was going to make to Konoha's shinobi system and filing them within a secret drawer in his desk, he lit his pipe and leaned back in his chair to consider his most recent issue, Naruto. If the boy had made contact with his tenant, then things were going to be a lot more difficult, both in getting Naruto to trust him and in keeping the civilians from killing him. Hiruzen also considered the idea of labeling Naruto as a flight risk if he had, much as he wanted to avoid it. Hiruzen put his thoughts to one side as he heard clear knocks against the door, the knocks being in a slightly different rhythm that indicated it was the group of Anbu that was assigned as Naruto's bodyguard. Enter, Hiruzen called briefly, mentally preparing for Naruto's loud entrance, as was usually the case. Hokage-sama the Anbu greeted as they entered the office, while Naruto greeted him the same as usual, just slightly quieter. Right, Naruto, I believe you have something to tell me, Hiruzen said as he watched the boy sit down. And I will tell you, but can you send the other Anbu out of the room first, Naruto replied evenly. Hiruzen did so as he would still have six Anbu in the room with him, and Naruto wasn't likely to try anything. Gigi, are you sure you have sent out all the other Anbu? Naruto had sensed another person who seemed to be in the air vents. The Hokage nodded slowly, and Naruto leaned over to Dog and said something to him quietly, who twitched slightly, showing her surprise before moving quickly. Reaching into the air vent, Dog dragged him out and knocked him out before he could react, revealing another root member, clearly with the intention of eavesdropping on the Hokage's meeting. Hiruzen ordered Turtle to take the man quickly to the TNI department and repeating the same process as they had yesterday. After Turtle was gone the Hokage walked to a wall and activated a privacy seal to make sure that no one would be able to eavesdrop on them. Naruto then began to tell the story of what had happened last night, from his desperation at failing the exam, up until he met his mother and Kyari in the seal. He then asked the six other people in the room to be touch a part of his head. They questioned as to why he wanted them to do this, unsurprisingly. Before he explained that his mother and Kyare were going to bring them into the mindscape so they could talk to them. Although clearly rather apprehensive, they did as he asked, and there was a flash of light from each of their hands as they touched Naruto's head. Within the mindscape, Naruto and the others appeared within the same part of the mindscape that Naruto first arrived in, and all apart from Naruto felt a shard of sadness and guilt when they saw the state of Naruto's mind. Finally it made them all the more determined to help the blonde. Naruto began to eagerly lead them towards Kyare's prison as he had named that room-like structure in his mind, although in the beginning the others, especially the Anbu were rather grudging of their situation. When they had reached the set of huge prison bars, though they were even more tentative, as each of them had rather vivid memories of the Kyubi when it attacked Konoha. All of them were stunned as they beheld Kushina and Kyare behind the bars, apart from Naruto, who rushed forward, shouting, Kachan, Kyare-chan. Both women looked up eagerly at the boy who was racing towards them. They embraced him as he jumped into the arms of his mother before giving Kyari a hug and lying down on the now vacated sofa. After introductions and the briefest explanations as to Kyari's current form they turned to Naruto to find that he had fallen asleep. Poor boy, must still be exhausted from last night, the young do need a lot of sleep after all. Hiruzen chuckled, and the others smiled at the sleeping boy. Anbu, I believe you can remove your masks here as we are among friends, and they can't tell anyone anyway, apart from Naruto that is but he is going to know soon enough anyhow, Hiruzen said cordially. The Anbu proceeded to slowly remove their masks, one after the other. Raven was revealed to be Yuhi Kurunai, Snake was Mitarashi Anko, 
and cat was Uzuki Yugao. Weasel then revealed himself to be Uchiha Itachi. Dog reached up ever so slowly to his mask, making everyone roll their eyes, before he removed his mask to reveal, another mask. Everyone face faulted at the sight. He then introduced himself as Hatake Kakashi, before the Hokage mentioned something about his true self. Kakashi released a genjutsu without any fuss, revealing a white-haired version of Kuranai and twin three Tomoe Sharingan spinning in either eye, as Ren had accidentally coded the Sharingan into Kakashi's DNA. Kakashi then reintroduced himself as Hatake Kaneko. However, she didn't get the reaction of surprise that she wanted his head teammates and the Hokage already knew, she had told Kushina when she became part of Minato's Janon team and the QB knew as she used her sense of smell to determine her gender under the genjutsu fu and jutsu combo. And Naruto, the only person who didn't know, was still asleep. The seven humans and one by Jiu then began talking of what they were going to do with Naruto's training and the treatment in his life so far. When the subject of his treatment came up, Kushina looked close to beating the crap out of the San Daime, but refrained, as she understood that as the Hokage, there were limitations as to what he could do for Naruto. They settled that, as the hope for Naruto having a normal childhood was already ruined, he would be trained in secret by the six Anbu guarding him, along with Kushina and the Kyare. When the Anbu and the Hokage learned the truth of what happened on the night of Kyare's attack on Konoha, they were disbelieving at first, but after Kushina showed her own memories of the incident, they quickly forgave Kyare. They concluded that Naruto would be trained privately by the Anbu in Taijutsu, Ninjutsu, Genjutsu, and Kanjutsu. He would also be training in his bloodlines with Itachi and Kushina and he and Kanako would both be learning Fuu and Jutsu from Kushina in the Mindscape. They finally concluded that he would also be training and controlling Kyare's power with Kyare, although all the Yanbu had to be present when he did, in order for safety reasons. They knew that once word got out of who Naruto actually was, and the fact that he had three bloodlines, he would be hunted for almost the remainder of his life, unless he was strong enough to defend himself from some of the strongest shinobi on the planet. They then woke Naruto up and explained the situation. Although surprised that Dog was actually a girl, the fact soon paled in comparison of his emotions when he realized that he was going to be privately trained by his best friends. As at the time Naruto had around two months before the academy started again, there was no problem with Naruto be trained all day every day. Although everyone training him would never forget the look of sheer horror on his face when he first received his timetable from his teachers. Flashback Naruto was unsure that they were intending for him to survive his training as he looked over the timetable his senseis had handed him. The Hokage had allowed the use of his private training ground for Naruto's training and all of the six Anbu were eager to be finally training their young charge. Monday Friday, 5 colon 30 wake up, 75 push-ups, sit-ups and squats, 20 laps around training ground with Guy. 6.15 to 6 colon 30 shower and breakfast, 6.30 to 9 colon 00 chakra control with Kakano and Kuranai. 9 o'clock to 12 colon 00 ninjutsu with Kakano and Itachi or Genjutsu with Kuranai and Yugao. 12 o'clock to 12 colon 45 lunch. 12.45 to 3 colon 00 daijutsu with Guy or weapons handling and traps with Onko. 3 o'clock to 6 colon 00 fuu and jutsu with Kushina in Mindscape accompanied by Kanako. 6 o'clock to 7 colon 30 academic studies on tactics and strategy, along with other academic theory. 7.30 to 8 colon 00 dinner, wash up. 8 o'clock to 9 colon 30 homework, personal training. 9 colon 30 lights out. Naruto looked up at his teachers in complete horror, but Yugao, seeing the face he was making and lips working in amusement gave him his timetable for the weekends. Saturday. 6 colon 30 wake up. Light warm up. 6.45 to 9 colon 30 Kenjutsu basics and practice with Yugao. 9.30 to 10 colon 00 breakfast, shower. 10 o'clock to 1 colon 00 bloodline training with Itachi and Kushina. 1 o'clock to 4 colon 00 academic studies from the academy. 4 o'clock to 9 colon 00 free time. 9 colon 00 lights out. Sunday. 9 colon 00 wake up, breakfast, shower. 9.45 to 12 colon 00 ninjutsu practice. 12 o'clock to 9 colon 00 homework private training, and free time. 9 colon 00 lights out. Naruto looked at the timetable in shock, before grumbling under his breath knowing he needed this training, and that although it would be tough, it should also be really fun. Wait a minute, what about the academy? I mean, I can't be doing this when I need to go to the academy, Naruto asked. We will teach you a clone technique, called the blood clone, that will allow you to send a clone to the academy and learn the basic information there, such as history which we don't have time to be teaching you. In many of your lessons with us we will be using the shadow clone technique that you learned from the Forbidden Scroll, as it retains knowledge that it has learned, including muscle memory, ninjutsu, 
chakra control and fu and jutsu. In fact it retains pretty much everything apart from muscle training, allowing you to learn multiple things at once, Kanako explained, not taking her eyes off a small orange book that she was reading called Icha Icha Paradise. As today is a Saturday we shall rest for the remainder of today, then tomorrow we shall be buying your equipment, such as shinobi clothes, practice weapons, sealing supplies, and books on chakra control, survival and cooking. The next day the training will begin, Itachi said, in a calm voice. Naruto saw a gleam of excitement within Onko's eyes that made him sure he had no idea what he had gotten himself into. On Monday morning he showed up at the Hokage's private training ground wearing the shinobi clothes that he had been bought yesterday, black combat boots, black pants that were tucked into the boots, black long sleeve shirt that melded to his torso and arms and had a black hood, and a light gray combat vest with extra pockets, a high collar and dark orange outlines. He had his kunai holster strapped to his left thigh, with his shuriken holster strapped to his right. As he watched Guy walk into the training ground with his onbu gear and mask on, he felt an irresistible urge that this was going to hurt. He was right, as 45 minutes later he was limping home trying to quicken his pace as his legs began to seize up. As he ate a healthy breakfast he internally groaned as he realized that if all his training sessions were like this, he was going to hurt like crazy tomorrow, and the day after, and the day after that. In fact, he wasn't going to stop hurting. He heard giggles from his mother and Kyari as they heard his thoughts and he sighed, having two people inside one's head made it difficult to keep anything private. He washed up his bowl, before setting back off towards the training ground for his chakra control session, hopefully this one wouldn't be as physically exhausting. It wasn't, but it still hurt like crazy when he fell of the tree he was walking up and landed on his upper back, which happened several times. Then he had ninjutsu training with Itachi Sensei and Kakano Sensei in which most of it was him and his clones reading about chakra theory, before they taught him to do a basic henge technique. Naruto quickly saw the possible applications in the technique, and made a mental note to his mother to remind him to send 50 henged shadow clones to the library on Sunday. Naruto then went home in order to have lunch, before returning for his lesson in kunai and shuriken handling and practice from Anko sensei It was pretty dull once one learned the proper way to throw kunai and shuriken, as after that it was pure repetition and practice, but Naruto stuck with it knowing that it may one day save his life. Fu and Jutsu with Kachan and Kakano Sensei in the Mindscape was pretty fun, as he learned the basic kanji needed for beginner seals, although he had clones practicing perfecting his writing. The hour and a half of academic studies after that was slow and boring, but learning about the importance of strategy made him perk up, as he would do anything necessary to save the lives of his friends and family. All in all, by the time dinner came around he was both physically and mentally exhausted and he still had hand seals to practice afterwards. Flashback end. It had been two years since the beginning of his training and Naruto had completely broken anyone expectations of him, as he could now go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Anbu captains, he would lose, but he could still give them a challenge. Anyone below that sort of skill level he could beat. His taijutsu was insanely strong, and he was creating his own personal style from a mix of Gokan, the Uchiha Interceptor style, and the Uzumaki Phoenix style. His ninjutsu was impressive, as he knew various DS rank techniques for each of his affinities, which were water, lightning, wind, and earth. Although he had mastered his water, wind and lightning affinities, he still needed to work on his earth affinities, but had managed to combine his water and wind into ice due to his senju bloodline. His kenjutsu was at the point where he could go up against some of the top kenjutsu masters in the elemental nations and win, as he had, with the use of cage bunshine, perfected the Uzumaki style and dances, which were some of the best. His Genjutsu, though impressive for his age and still better than most, was the weakest of his fields, as being the Jinchuriki of the Kyuubi made controlling and fine-tuning Genjutsu difficult. His Fu and Jutsu was his most impressive field however, as he was considered equal by his mother to Uzumaki Mito, the best Fu and Jutsu user in history. His Sharingan had two tomos in each eye, meaning that he could see chakra and see incoming moves, but couldn't copy the techniques of others. He primarily used his Uzumaki bloodline in order to be able to ride his seals in midair, and to create chakra chains in battle, although he occasionally used it to create wings of his chakra attached to his back and fly over Konoha. Things had gotten better in Konoha over the past few years, the Hokage had regained back most of his former influence in the village, the council elders had been retired and Tsunade had replaced them. Jiraiya had escaped from being an elder due to the responsibilities of his spy ring. Although he had established a ring in Konoha to help the Hokage ferret out secrets within the village, Tsunade had, after some persuasion, returned to Konoha and replaced the two advisors, Homura and Koharu, along with being appointed the head of Konoha's hospital. She now conducted courses for potential medic nins along with her apprentice, Shizune, 
although she had become quite doting over Naruto, after learning that he was the last male Senju. After the responsibility of the academy was placed back into shinobi hands, the courses were much more about them surviving the shinobi lifestyle than learning history or flower pressing. As such, many of the civilian children dropped out, especially if they were fangirls. By this time however, the Dobi Naruto had already been established and he didn't really care anyway, as he was years ahead of his class. His blood clone had a lot of fun skipping out on class and pulling massive pranks. Things had gotten so well that Kakano was able to fully take off her Kakashi persona without fear of being turned into a breeding machine by the civilian council. Finally, the most drastic thing that had happened was Donzo being run out of Konoha, as a few months ago the Anbu had finally moved against the hidden root bases within the village as the Hokage had used the route he had caught against Donzo, amassing a huge amount of information on his activities. They had succeeded with capturing the majority of the root shinobi, but Donzo had managed to flee with some of his upper echelon. Naruto had used his Fu and Jutsu to take off many of the seals on the captured root shinobi, and had managed to gain a friend, called Sai, who was now utterly loyal to Naruto. It was rather awkward when he started following Naruto around incessantly, but he believed that Naruto was worth it as he knew Naruto had saved him from becoming a weapon. After a month, the Anbu shrugged and began training him too. Although Danzo's exile paled in comparison to the mission Itachi had to carry out two months ago, as he had to kill his father, Uchiha Fugaku and several other clan members after they had slaughtered the rest of his clan. Fugaku had escaped after he had used Tsukinomi on Sasuke, Itachi's younger brother, to convince him that it was Itachi that had killed the rest of the clan. After this, Itachi was forced to flee Konoha and be branded an S-rank missing nin, although he still received missions from the Hokage. At the moment he was on orders to infiltrate an organization known as Akatsuki, and had found out three key things about them. 1. It was an organization that was trying to protect the Jinchuriki of the Baiju from another organization known as Gurai. 2. The leader of the organization possessed the Rinnegan, and 3. Orochimaru was part of the organization and was innocent of his crimes and Danzo was behind the inhumane experimentations. The only people who knew of Itachi's current situation were his former Anbu teammates, Naruto and Sai, the Hokage, Tsunade, and Jiraiya, and the Shinobi clan heads. Itachi's information provided a link between Danzo and files that had been found in his quarters pertaining to the group called Kurai. Naruto, in Itachi's absence had become good friends with his mother, Uchiha Mikoto and had received a new sensei called Gekko Hayate, who was the second of Konoha's two sword masters, the first being Yagao. The two regularly went into Naruto's mindscape with him in order to receive Kenjutsu training from Kushina, whose skill with swords had been legendary when she was around. At the moment Naruto, Sai, Kanako, Yugao, Anko, Kurinai, Gai, and Hayate stood in the Hokage's office, having received a visit from Anbu telling them to be here. Hiruzen looked at each of them hoping to use this mission as a chance to get Naruto and Sai used to facing other shinobi, as both had done several C ranks as a pair, but he wasn't completely sure the two were up to it alone. Alright, you eight are here for an S rank mission, the Sundaime started before he was interrupted. Jigi, are you feeling alright? Naruto asked, the idea of the Sundaime giving him an S rank at his age was preposterous. Naruto, I can assure you I feel perfectly fine. Now, as to what this mission entails. You have all heard of the current Kiri Bloodline Purge, is that correct? Receiving mute nods, he continued, they are eliminating bloodlines, and although we shouldn't interfere, I am sending you eight to retrieve surviving members of as many bloodline clans as possible to bring them back to Konoha so they can live in peace. Priority clans are those that already had smaller dwindling numbers to begin with, as their bloodlines are the most likely to be eradicated. Due to our information from Jiraiya's spy network we are able to give you the general locations for many bloodline survivor groups but it is likely that these locations won't last for long, therefore you will have to split up into two teams. Jigi, why are Sai and I here, rather than more experienced Anbu members? Naruto questioned seriously, understanding the gravity of this mission. All of our Anbu that are experienced enough for this missions are out of the village, and you are very capable yourself, after all you two were taught by some of the best, Hiruzen explained. He didn't want to send Naruto out for this mission but any less than 8 and they wouldn't be able to reach many survivors in time. U8 will be handling extracting them from combat, while others teams will be extracting the ones in safety into fire country, you save a group, contact another team and move on. You'll be both saving lives and benefiting Konoha, Hiruzen outlined. You have 3 hours to prepare, and remember to take extra supplies as you'll be going into a war zone, and that the injured may need them. The extraction force is gathering at the west gate. Naruto watched on in wonderment as 78 Anbu members gathered at the main gate along with him and Sai, 
a fair few of them being former Root members. It was the largest gathering of senior shinobi he had ever seen, and thankfully he didn't have to put up with disparaging remarks as both he and Sai had sparred a number of them in one. For this mission, they had both been given Anbu masks, Fox for Naruto, ironically, and Hawk for Sai. They had been put on a team with Kanako and Onko, while Yugao, Kurinai, Hayate and Guy formed the other combat team. The rumor of Naruto and Sai being trained by the top had circulated around Anbu, and they welcomed the two better than they did with most new rookies. Naruto withdrew one of his twin ninjato from a man's chest as the encounter ended. His team was outside of the Yuki clan compound in Karagakur no Sato, and were defending against waves of bloodline haters as two other teams evacuated the remaining Yuki clan members and cut their way out of the city to the rendezvous point. There were only around 15 adults remaining, along with around 25 children and babies. All the others were dead or had managed to flee. Kanako, Anko, Naruto and Sai moved on towards the Kaguya compound to find two or three clan members using their bloodline to become whirlwinds of death amongst the enemy ranks. Naruto had one thought as he watched their bones return to their bodies, Yuck Kanako moved forward announcing their presence and intentions to the clan members, who had rearmed themselves with bone swords until they saw the Konoha mark on their Anbu masks. Kanako and the clansmen agreed that her team would hold the entrance to the compound while they gathered their surviving members and waited for the retrieval teams to return. Three minutes after the clansmen retreated within the compound to inform their clan head and begin to prepare, a group of around 30 bloodline haters showed up carrying torches to set the compound alight. Naruto sighed as he unsheathed his ninjutos and channeled wind chakra through one and lightning chakra through the other. He stood passively as seven of the enemy shinobi charged him until they got within five meters of him then he jumped onto the first man's shoulders, knocked him down to the ground, rolled and stabbed another through the chest. He didn't know that he had unconsciously used his Uzumaki bloodline and created wings of solid, blazing chakra behind him. The fight, lasting a two days and a night, was later labeled bone fires and earned him a place in the bingo book at the age of nine as Deathly Angel. At the rendezvous point, Several days later, Kanako's team walked wearily into the campsite they had labeled as the rendezvous point after retrieval was completed. They were covered in blood, having been fighting constantly for the last few days. They were the last team out, all the others already gathered, along with around 200 bloodline survivors of various clans, the biggest being the Kaguya and the Okami, a clan that possessed the wolf summoning contract. As the Anbu guarding the camp announced that the last team had arrived they were given three hours to clean themselves up and prepare their equipment. Thankfully, due to the fact that their team and Yu Gao's team had the element of surprise on their side, neither had sustained losses, and the other teams had avoided contact and snuck their charges out of the village. As Naruto took a makeshift shower, he reflected that although they had retrieved all the survivors in the various compounds and those that were hiding out, there was still a high likelihood that some had escaped. He remembered the Yuki clan and decided that they, along with the Okami were probably his favorite, as he had connections to both of them. Being the bearer of Kyari gave him a connection to the Okami, while his ice-style ninjutsu, gave him a connection to the Yuki clan as their bloodline allowed the use of ice style as well. Later when the huge group began to move out towards Konoha, as all the survivors knew that Konoha treasured those with bloodlines and treated its shinobi as more than weapons, and pretty much all had agreed to live in Konoha. Naruto, Sai, and the rest of the Konoha Anbu spaced themselves out equally around the walking column, with Naruto being closest to the Yuki clan members, as Kanako already saw that he liked them. The column would stop for a break after six hours of walking before going for another six hours. They could have traveled at shinobi speeds, but that would mean leaving the children and the elderly behind to fend for themselves, something that all refused to do. They arrived at Konoha's gates two weeks later, drawing the attention of many. As the survivors were setting up a camp outside of Konoha's walls, with Anbu guarding all inside against any that might do harm, a member of each clan was elected as clan head who were then escorted to the Hokaye's office by Kanako's and Yugao's teams. Opening the door to the office, Naruto and the others remained behind as the new clan heads engaged in conversation with the Hokage. Explaining the situation to each of the clan heads, Hiruzen outlined that they would be building new clan compounds in vacant areas within Konoha's walls, and that their clan's people were to be full-functioning citizens or shinobi of Konoha if they wished. The heads agreed, before recounting their tales to the Hokage. Their voices were full of admiration as they recounted their viewings of the two teams waiting behind them. When the Kaguya had mentioned the wings of chakra upon Naruto's back, Hiruzen almost sighed in annoyance, as there had been a recent bingo book entry just labeled Deathly Angel, which was seen fighting outside the Kaguya compound. Thankfully they didn't know his affiliation was Konoha. 
he made arrangements for the new heads of the new clans to meet the current clan heads of Konoha. He waited for them to leave while escorted by Anbu before allowing the others to come forward. Remove your masks, he said and they did so quietly, even Naruto knowing that this wasn't the time to talk out of turn. Report, Kanako, and so she began. Hiruzen mind turned to shock as he heard some of the battles won by Kanako's team. Four of them against almost 150 cell swords were highly unreasonable odds, and ones in which it was quite likely they would have died but they managed to pull through without any serious injuries. Well, it sounds like the mission was more than successful, as you retrieved all available bloodline users without any serious injuries therefore each of you will receive payment for an S rank mission and a C rank on top of that. The Hokage smiled and let them troop out so they could go home and get some rest. Naruto smiled as he lay on his bed after showering and eating, sure he had killed. But what mattered was that he and his teammates had made it through unharmed while simultaneously completing the mission. Over the past three years Naruto had been training in more and more advanced subjects, his taijutsu was equal to guys, he was wearing chakra weights that were on level 8 out of 20, and he had resistance seals level 5 out of 50. His ninjutsu variation was equal with Kanako's, he had finally mastered his earth element, and was now experimenting with mixing his affinities. He was going quite well with ice, as he had started to train with the Yuki clan was starting to activate Makuten, and had even created an ultimate defense using both moving eyes panels, and a swirling sphere of water, wind and lightning which he liked to call his storm element. His Kenjutsu was greater than that of the seven swordsmen of the mist, and could combine it with both Genjutsu and Taijutsu. His Genjutsu was on the level of a Jonin, and he primarily used it in conjunction with his Kenjutsu. His Fuu and Jutsu was where he excelled, he had used seals and the creativity of his mind to solve many problems creating entirely new structures. He had even invented something he called a hoverbike, which allowed for fast and easy transport and could be guided by the legs, leaving the hands free for other tasks, but he had yet to tell anyone, as he knew that allowing it for public use could have disastrous consequences. His Sharingan had each gained their third Tomoe, but he rarely used it to copy techniques, though he did have a good look at the Uchiha library's lightning techniques. His Uzumaki bloodline he started to think up new uses, such as using it for pure chakra techniques to create even more devastating versions. Naruto had done a lot more missions for what he got bored, or stumped on an idea, most of them being CRB rank missions that he did with Sai. Although he had also done a few more A and S ranks when it was needed. Sai had also advanced to the point where he could give most Anbu a beating. As such they spent a lot of time looking for Jiraiya, when he was in Konoha so they could have a spar. Naruto and Tsunade actually figured out another part of the Senju bloodline, which was that once an ancestor had reached a new peak in their field of expertise, all those directly descended from that person could reach that peak even if it wasn't their field of ninjutsu. The two were completely shocked by this find as it meant that the longer the clan lived, the more powerful each member grew. They only figured this out when Tsunade reached the Nidimes level with her water affinity, in a spar and both were too shocked to comprehend what had happened until several days later. Although Naruto had begun studying medical ninjutsu at a feverish pace, currently Naruto was getting dressed in what he had been using for almost the last five years, black combat boots, black pants, black long-sleeved form-fitting shirt with a hood attached that he used on missions, and a light grey combat vest with an orange Uzumaki spiral on the back. Both his pants and shirt had black non-reflective leather armor sewn on and he had white bandages wrapped around his left thigh. He now had a pair of black leather fingerless gloves that had armor plates on the back of the bombs. He also wore a mask like Kanako did that hid everything below his eyes. He had his twin ninja toes sheathed and strapped to his back in an X. Usually Naruto would be getting dressed like this for private training, but not today, no, today he was attending the graduation exams and was going to reveal his true self. This would be the first time he had gone to the academy personally in around 5 years and he didn't miss it due to the memories of the blood clones he created. He had to say it, Sasuke was a complete and utter jerk ever since Satachi left, even to his mother. Kiba was both arrogant that he was a clan heir and too headstrong, while Hinata was almost the exact opposite. Shikamaru and Choji both had good potential but were too lazy to actually train. Then there was Shino, who was actually probably the best student there, apart from Sasuke, and the one who would become the Ness Ninja. Then there were really just a bunch of fangirls chased after Sasuke, but two girls, Sakura and Dino, headed them, who had apparently ditched their friendship when they learned the other was going after Sasuke. Stupid. Naruto walked into the academy an hour and a half early, and sat in a chair next to the window. He then unsealed a violin from a storage seal on his vest, and began playing, unaware that Hiruka had just walked into the room. The tuning stopped for a moment before shrugging, 
as he knew that Naruto was receiving private training from Anbu, and could probably kill him relatively easily. As he sorted through papers on his desk to prepare for the exam, he listened quietly to the sound of Naruto's violin. There were several times when he could envision a situation and the music would fit perfectly, and a chill would creep down his neck. As the time passed other students began to walk into the classroom only to stop in silence as they saw Naruto playing the violin, before sitting down silently. When there were only a few minutes to go until the bell rang, everyone in the classroom heard the sound of drumming feet. Outside, as both Ino and Sakura raced towards the door of their classroom they heard the sound of music emanating from the classroom. Ah, it must be Sasuke who is playing the violin so beautifully, they both thought, obviously he is feeling very emotional, so this is my chance to marry him. They both burst through the door loudly before screaming out, Marry me, Sasuke-kun. The silence following this proclamation was stunningly loud before Naruto spoke up. If you're looking for the arrogant ass, he's behind you. Sasuke-kun. Both of them ignored Naruto insulting Sasuke in order to greet him. Sasuke just walked past them silently. Can you play the violin again for us Sasuke-kun? Ino asked eagerly. Sasuke just looked at her with a confused face before grunting and motioning with his head at Naruto. Both girls looked at Naruto, unsure why, but Sasuke had asked it so why not? Then they saw the violin in his hands. Naruto Baka. How dare you steal property from the magnificent Sasuke-kun, give it back right this instant. Sakura screeched loudly. Why should I give it to him, when it's mine? Naruto asked in a bored tone. How could it be yours, you're just a no-good clamless orphan. This time Sakura was even louder. Before she knew it, Naruto had disappeared from his seat, she was lying on her back on the floor, and Naruto was standing over her, eyes burning in anger. Just because I am the last of my clan, doesn't mean I am clanless. Naruto said in a voice thick with fury. And as he said those words Sakura saw images of her own death. The next second he was back in his chair, with everyone staring at him. He tapped his foot impatiently motioning for Iruka to get on with it and hand the written exams out. Iruka coughed, he hadn't been expecting such an angry reaction from Naruto when it came to his family, before gathering the written exams from his desk and handing them out. Alright, you have one and a half hours to complete the exam, do your best, and good luck. Your time begins now. Iruka said, starting the countdown clock. Everyone that wasn't Sasuke, Shikamaru or Naruto immediately turned the page over and began scrabbling furiously. Shikamaru calmly answered a few questions before going back to sleep, Sasuke wrote calmly as he worked his way through the paper, and Naruto wrote calmly and fast, finishing the test in 15 minutes before bringing his violin back out and playing for the remainder of the time. Iruka was about to criticize him for distracting the other students but the words got lost somewhere along the way to his mouth. All the others seemed to be very reflective as they answered the paper, the last finishing with five minutes to spare. After each had finished, they listened to the sound of the violin silently. When the time finally finished, Naruto calmly put his violin away and allowed the gathering of the test papers to be quiet. Iruka announced after the papers were piled on his desk that they would now be moving out to the practice range to test their shuriken and kunai throwing. After that there would be a break for 45 minutes as he graded the written exams before they had the taijutsu tournament and finally the ninjutsu exam. As they walked through the academy to the practice range it was unnaturally quiet, as many members of the class were thinking about how different Naruto was today. Meanwhile Naruto was training in his sensor capabilities, and he had just found Sai, as he knew he would be following him as the former root was very overprotective when it came to Naruto's emotions. He rolled his eyes and continued walking. The graduation class soon arrived at the practice range and each student had to throw ten kunai and shuriken at a target, it could be all at the same time or one after the other. Many of the class got average results but managed to pass, although on principle the clan heirs and heiresses did better than students from civilian families. Finally it was the turn of one Uchiha Sasuke, and Naruto watched him closely to see exactly how much the boy had developed. The black-haired boy managed to get 8 tenths for the kunai and 7 tenths for the shuriken. Naruto summed up that he wasn't too bad but there were better, as the fangirls in the class cheered and screeched in support of their Sasuke-kun. Poor bastard. Uzumaki Naruto, Iruka called him forward. He strode over picked up the shuriken and kunai, and in a flash of silver they were embedded in the center of the target. Everyone's jaws dropped, as he hadn't even been looking at the target, he had been reading a book. Naruto just went back to where he had been leaning against a nearby tree. Everyone got over their shock as Iruka, who then quickly began walking back to the academy as he had a bunch of test papers to mark, announced the lunch break. Naruto just walked over to where he knew Sai was before engaging him in conversation. You seem to be having fun, Sai commented. How could I be having fun? I am so bored, Naruto whined, 
a bit like a child. You seem to be having fun messing with their heads, Sai elaborated, grinning, a bit like a cat. You bet, some of the looks of shock, I should have bought a camera. Actually, I should have bought a camera, Naruto said, frowning in disappointment. The two of them continued to talk for the rest of the time, until Naruto had to go back to the academy for the tournament. I would say goodbye, but I know you're just going to follow me so you can tell Onko-sensei how I did before I can, Naruto said smiling. He knew his friend too well. Seeing his friend nod he shook his head in exasperation before walking back to the academy. Three minutes later he was rolling his eyes as Iruka explained the exam to the class. First they had to either survive sparring against him for five minutes, or beat him in those five minutes, before they would move on to the tournament. Many of the class suffered a few hits while sparring Iruka, even among the clan heirs, and no one managed to beat him, discounting Sasuke. Iruka called Naruto into the ring, and the blonde walked forward, slouched comfortably and pulled out the same book from before. Knowing that Naruto was trying to rile him up, Iruka stayed calm, and seeing that Naruto wouldn't be starting the spar, he charged. Naruto regarded Iruka lazily before disappearing in a blur of speed. The next second, everyone was watching as Iruka was trying to struggle futilely against a combination elbow-shoulder lock that Naruto had placed him in. He then tapped out, accepting the defeat. Naruto just strolled contently out of the ring, taking note of the jealous look that crossed Sasuke's face. The Taijutsu tournament that followed was probably the most interesting part of the day as it allowed Naruto to see how the clan heirs reacted in certain situations, although he almost smashed his head into the wall when Shikamaru, after passing the rounds necessary to graduate, forfeited, saying it was just too troublesome to continue. Naruto passed through all of his fights easily, knocking out his opponents before they could react, using his insanely superior speed. Even his fight against Sasuke was a complete letdown, as one moment he was standing opposite Sasuke in the ring, the next he was standing where Sasuke had been, with the Uchiha unconscious at his feet. And the Ninjutsu exam was a complete disappointment, it was taken in a different room, where none could watch and one only has to perform three basic jutsu. Naruto was walking out of the academy after he and the rest of the graduates were told to come here at 10 o'clock tomorrow to receive their team assignments. Naruto had already figured out who his team and sensei were going to be. Uchiha Sasuke and Yamanaka Ino, with their sensei being Kanako Nechan, their sensei had to be Kanako as Sasuke was going to need training in his Sharingan and his mother was a retired Kunoichi, therefore not technically allowed to train Shinobi, and the only other person with the Sharingan was Kanako. Meanwhile his teammates had to be Sasuke and Ino as they were the rookie and the Kunoichi of the year, which always gets put with a class Dobi, in other words, him, thanks to his clone. Although he did wonder exactly how they planned to deal with Sai, who refused to be on a team unless Naruto was on the same team, as such he spent much of his time on solo missions nowadays, but he was scheduled to take the upcoming Chunin exams in Konoha. Naruto spent his time working on a personal project of his at the moment, creating a way to get rid of Anko Nechan's cursed mark of heaven. As he was unable to come up with any answers at the moment, he was too distracted, he decided to go to the Hokage's Jutsu library to see if there was a technique that he felt like learning, or perhaps give him inspiration for his own. Naruto loved making new jutsu, it was so cool, especially since he could get a basic idea of one within a few hours and could begin thinking of viable hand seal chains within days. As such, several people, including the Hokage, labeled him a genius in the art. He had adapted several normal jutsus for wind into ice jutsus and was beginning to adapt lightning jutsus for his storm affinity. The next morning he strolled into the academy at 945. The only reason he was early was because he wanted to see what teams were assigned to Kurunai Nechan and Asuma, otherwise he would have slept in a lot longer or gone off to Ijiraku Ramen. His blood clone had been right about that place, it was awesome. As he lolled in his chair in the classroom along with the other graduates while they were waiting for Iruka, Naruto could sense Kurunai and Asuma's chakra walking closer to the academy. No doubt he was bugging her again, the idiot. You see, as soon as Kanako had revealed her true self to Konoha. Asuma dumped Kurunai to go and see if he could get a date with her, and when he was denied, came back and tried to hook up with Kurunai again. He had been Jinjutsu'd into the hospital, and Kanako, Kurunai and Anko had become known as the three ice queens of Konoha. A side effect of his actions was that he earned the contempt of Naruto, and had received quite a few beatings from it too. Naruto sat up in his chair as Iruka announced the teams containing the clan heirs. Team 7, Uchiha Sasuke, Yamanaka Ino, Uzumaki Naruto with Sai's attaché, your sensei is Hatake Kanako. Team 8, Aburame Shino, Inuzu Kakiba, Hayuga Hinata, your sensei is Yuhi Kurunai. Team 10, Narashi Kamaru, Akimichi Ichoji, Haruno Sakura, your sensei is Asuma Sarutobi. 
Iruka then told them to remain here until their sensei picks them up. Within five minutes Kuro and I was picking up her team, and Naruto could see the reaction on Kiba's face when he saw her and knew that he would be bugging Kuro and I to marry him. No wonder Kuro and I saw males as complete and utter idiots. Asuma then came in, and ordered his Janan to follow after him, give Naruto smug glances all the while. Soon the only team remaining was Naruto, who proceeded to talk apparently to thin air. You can come out now Sai. Naruto, there's no one there. Ino had changed how she addressed him but felt the need to point this out. Sasuke just watched in contempt of who was on his team. That is until Sai dropped from the ceiling. You didn't need to make such a spectacular entrance, you're only meeting the two on our team, I give it a 7 tenths, Naruto commented. Sai pouted before snorting disdainfully and grumbling under his breath. Do you two know each other? Ino asked cautiously. So Naruto explained that they had been training together since they were eight, leaving out Sai's past with Danzo and Root. The team proceeded to split back up, Sasuke was brooding, Ino was fawning over him, Sai began to draw in his book, and Naruto brought a steaming bowl of hot ramen from one of his storage scrolls. This was how Kanako found them one and a half hours later, except that Naruto was reading a scroll on storm chakra control exercises. She looked in the doorway, having already checked that no pranks were in the vicinity, and smiled at seeing Sai and Naruto, who she considered younger brothers. Team 7, meet me up on the roof in 5 minutes. She announced before disappearing with a sunshine. Naruto and Sai followed her example, shocking Ino and Sasuke. Sai disappeared in the classic leaf sunshine, while Naruto did a combination of water and lightning. Up on the roof, both rushed to Kakano and hugged her, shouting in joy at seeing their Nei-chan again, before Naruto asked her where she had been the last few days. Just an A-rank to destroy a bandit camp, Naruto and Sai nodded unconcerned. But before they could do anything more the door to the stairwell opened and Sasuke and Dino walked out onto the roof. Kakano immediately went into business mode, she might relax with her autos in private, but in public, especially on a mission, she treated them the same as all the others. Alright, let's begin by doing introductions, state your name, likes, dislikes, hobbies, specialities, and your dream. I will go first as Ino and Sasuke don't know me as well as you two. My name is Hitake Kanako, I have a few likes a few dislikes, a number of hobbies that you're too young to know, my speciality is in ninjutsu, but I can do moderately well in all the others, especially few unjutsu, my dream, well I don't need to tell you that, Kanako outlined with a straight face. Ino and Sasuke both had slight tick marks on their foreheads, while Naruto and Sai were desperately trying to control their laughter and failing. Kanako then motioned for Sai to introduce himself, as he was the other unknown to the academy too. My name is Sai, I like training, drawing in Naruto and my senseis. My dislikes are Donzo, his root, traitors and rapists. My hobbies are drawing and hanging out with Naruto, including helping him with a few of his pranks. My speciality is ink-based ninjutsu, and stealth. My dream is to kill Donzo and his root, in order to protect my friends. Ino was a little curious and asked Sai why he disliked root and Donzo so much. Kakano and Naruto knew that she was treading on precarious ground and Naruto quickly began to introduce himself before she pushed Sai to answer. My name is Uzumaki Naruto, I like my adoptive family, Sai, the Yuki and Okami clans, Kenjutsu, Fuu and Jutsu and training. My dislikes are the ways certain members of my adoptive family are treated or regarded by the public, rapists, lying bastards, the civilian council and Donzo. My hobbies are training in Fuu and Jutsu, Kenjutsu or Ninjutsu creating new jutsu, flying, creating new seals, playing my violin, and sparing with Uro Senen when he's in Konoha. My specialities are in Kanjutsu, Fuu and Jutsu, Ninjutsu, and Taijutsu, along with my bloodlines. My dream is to become Hokage of Konoha in order to protect everyone I care about. Ino and Sasuke regarded him in shock before Sasuke spoke of. What do you mean, bloodlines? I have three, but two are classified, so I can only show you the third which is from the Uzumaki clan, and allows me to make solid objects from my chakra alone, due to its potency, Naruto explained calmly. Kanako knew that if Sasuke learned of Naruto's Sharingan too soon, then he would react in a negative manner and become even more of a flight risk. She sighed internally, if they didn't tell Sasuke the truth soon, it was likely that he would abandon Konoha in search of a faster way to gain more power. She needed to talk to the Hokage. Kanako, Naruto and Sai listened as Sasuke and Ino introduced themselves and drew a rapid conclusion, the academy reports were correct, Sasuke was a power-obsessed Avenger, while Ino was a fangirl. It was the last one that made Kanako groan, half of the problems with fangirls was getting them to actually think about their crush logically. Alright, 
Now that we have all introduced ourselves I need to tell you that you aren't actually genins yet, as you have one more test to pass, Kanaka loves seeing the shocked faces on graduates when they are told this, what? Ino was confused, very, very confused. But we passed the academy exam, so therefore we are genins, aren't we? Not really, that was just to weed out the completely hopeless cases, who now attend one of the civilian schools. Meanwhile you have potential. But now you are being tested on whether you should be an active part in the shinobi forces. If you fail, you go back to the academy for another year, or are put into the reserves, in which you go through five years redoing basics and doing missions, although at the end you are promoted automatically to chunin. But the missions they do are non-combat missions. Also, this test has a 66% failure rate. Anyway, meet me at training ground 7 at 6 tomorrow for the test, Kakano explained the meaning, and as predicted, the look on Ino and Sasuke's face was highly amusing. Unfortunately Naruto and Sai already knew of the test, so they looked bored as Kakano explained the meaning of the test. After Kakano shun shined away, Naruto turned to Sai, so you had Kurunai Nei chan's training ground? After Sai nodded an affirmative and began drawing very quickly in his book, Naruto focused his chakra in the form of two wings on his back and leapt off the academy roof. Hearing Ino's startled shout behind him, Naruto grinned as the chakra quickly focused into solid wings that were attached to his back and he flew away towards training ground 8. Back on the roof Sasuke was reflecting on how much Naruto had changed in the space of two days, now he was even claiming to have three bloodlines. I will have that powered obi, and if you will not give it to me then I will take it. The next morning, 8.30. The next morning Naruto and Sai casually walked into training ground 7 two and a half hours after they were asked to be there, and ignored Ino berating them for oh being so late. Finally it got to a point where Naruto got annoyed. Ino, how can we be late if Nei-chan isn't even here yet, he said to try and stop Ino's shouts. And it worked, she couldn't respond because she didn't have an adequate response to Naruto comment, so she asked another question to try and figure out the enigma that was the new Naruto. Why do you call her that, she isn't related to you. Nei-chan is Nei-chan, Naruto responded, not giving anything away, as he Ino was a massive gossip. Hey, sorry I'm late guys, it seemed that Kanako had arrived. I got lost on the road of life. If you got lost, then how did you find your way again? Naruto asked, not really caring for the answer, as both he and Sai knew that Kanako had slept in late like they had. I followed you back to our house, Kanako replied, smiling. That is so cliched Nei-chan, Sai put in. Obviously we shouldn't start a band, it would be terrible, Naruto concluded finally. Anyway, onto the test, follow me. Your task is to get these three bells off of me within three hours. If you don't get a bell then you will be sent back to the academy, as there are four of you so we can always afford to send one back, Kanako said before tying the bells to her belt. Your time begins now. Sasuke and Ino both immediately rushed off into the bush, knowing that competing against a Jounin, one had to use tactics that were not straightforward. Meanwhile Sai and Naruto just relaxed and sat down against a tree, where Naruto brought out his violin and began to play. Shouldn't you two be like, helping your teammates through the exam? Kanako asked. We'll get them out of their situations after you have defeated them, and see if they respond well enough, which is unlikely, Sai explained in a relaxed manner. Kanako's only response was to sweat drop. Half an hour later Sasuke got impatient and threw several kunai at Kanako, before moving forward and engaging her in taijutsu. And although Sasuke was the best in their age group discounting Naruto and Sai, Kanako was a jounin who was several years older, had a lot more experience and was simply, a lot better. Sasuke. Although he got close enough to actually touch one of the bells soon, got the message, moving back and performing, fire style, grand fireball jutsu. Everyone was slightly shocked that an academy graduate had enough chakra to perform such a technique, before Naruto and Kakano remembered that it was a rite of passage for the Uchiha clan. When the fire dissipated, Sasuke was arrogant enough to think that Kakano had been incinerated by his technique and smirked, before the ground below him burst open and he was dragged by his ankles into the ground with only his head remaining above ground. Kakano then rose from the ground in front of him and told him that although he was very good for Jinan, there was a reason that she was a Jounin, before walking off into the bushes after Ino. Naruto sighed before putting his violin away and saying, Come on, we better go dig him out, as much as neither of us want to. As they dug Sasuke out of the ground, he didn't say a word, but as soon as he was out, he spat, I don't want nor need help from Yudobi, for Chiha never lose. Wow! So much for being polite and saying thank you, he also sounds scarily delusional, I mean, would she never lose? Sai commented with a frown. Kakano returned, saying, that Yamanaka is a fangirl to the point of it being scary, I put her in a genjutsu showing her dead family, 
and she gets out of it fine. Then I put her in a genjutsu showing a dead Sasuke and she immediately collapses and starts crying. It's just sad, because it shows that she cares more about Sasuke than her family. Actually, can you two go out and tie the two to the stumps here? I think it's time we give them a little demonstration. Kanako ordered. Sure thing Nei-chan, the two of them chirped. Within 15 minutes Ino and Sasuke had been tied to two of the three stumps and were about to wake up. As the two pairs of eyelids worked themselves open they came to the realization that they were in a highly uncomfortable position, with them being strapped to something in a way that meant their arms were secured and their shuriken and kunai out of reach. After she was sure that the two had woken up and were watching alertly, Kanako addressed the two. Now as you have both been missing the meaning of the test, I have arranged a demonstration that will give a hint. If at least one of you grasps the meaning of the test before the demonstration is over, all four of you will be given another chance after lunch for you to retrieve the bells. If not, then we shall have lunch and I shall decide who will be sent back to the academy. But since Sai is only an attaché, shouldn't that mean that he should be sent back if the three of us fail? Ino objected. Are you suggesting putting someone else's head on the chopping block to try and cover your own failures? Those are the words of a coward. Kanako was furious that an academy graduate would even suggest such a thing. Especially when he has skills greater than yours and Sasuke's combined and almost as great as my own. Now if you would, Naruto, Sai. She said, come once more. The two facing her nodded and as one, moved to attack her. To Sasuke and Ino, they were little more than blurs that occasionally launched Jutsu and Kunai. Sai and Naruto shepherded Kanako into a corner and began to launch Taijutsu attack after Taijutsu attack at her. Lightning, fire and earth jutsu streak across what looked to be a battleground in front of the two before the dust finally settled with Kanako holding a kunai to Sai's and Naruto's throats. Then they nodded to one another and relaxed. Ino was awed. It had seemed like every single hit had been thrown with the intent to kill, and the devastation caused by the fight was massive, trees were toppled, massive craters were steaming slightly, and dust had been thrown everywhere. Is this what Shinobi were truly capable of? She then thought of her own skills and promised to train harder, no matter what Sasuke wanted. Sasuke looked murderous, it seemed that no matter how much he trained, there was someone stronger than him. And although he could put up with Kanako being stronger than him, the fact that Naruto... The class Dobi was also stronger than him was galling. He needed that power to kill Itachi, and he vowed that he would have it, no matter the consequences. As Kanako walked over to the two graduates that were tied to the stumps, she asked, So why did they do better at fighting me than you two did? There was a long silence for about five minutes before Ino remembered a saying that she had heard her father say one time, Konoha is strong because we take care of our own, whether out in the field or at home, that is why Konoha is the strongest of the five. Ino had realized the meaning of the test. It was a test to see whether they could work together as a team, the bells were merely a distraction from the true aim. The true meaning of the test is teamwork, she spoke up, correct. The true test was to see if you could work together. If you cannot rely on your teammates, then whom can you rely on? After all, they will be facing the possibility of death alongside you. Now, time for lunch, she announced the last part while bringing out four bento boxes. Naruto, Sai, do not feed or cut down the other two. This is as punishment, for they forgot the most cardinal of shinobi rules in Konoha. She then stood and walked off into the forest. As soon as she was out of sight, Naruto opened another of the bento boxes and offered half of it to Ino. But she said not to, Ino objected. But if the test was over she wouldn't care, and if it was still going then she would applaud that I am ignoring the rules to help my teammate, Naruto reasoned before giving her some of the food as Sai did the same with Sasuke. He's right, you know, all turned to see Kanako watching them from the tree line. I was exactly the same as you once Sasuke, thinking that your teammates would only slow you down and that the mission was all that was important. I was a fool. But enough of that, you passed, you can cut them down. I will report your success to the Hokage. She disappeared in a sunshine. I will see you guys later, Naruto said, he had a project to work on. The current project that Naruto was working was really just an adjustment to his ninjitos. He was planning to engrave seals on them to give them special abilities like the swords of the seven mist swordsmen. Along with making them unbreakable and putting seals on the sheaths to make them able to hold his blades while being physically smaller. Small advantages like that could make all the difference while in the heat of battle. He also had Cage Bunshine practicing fighting with only one of his ninjatos while forming single-handed hand seals with the other. On a positive hand, he had finally been able to start practicing his Makuten Chakra exercises as it seemed he had finally found the balance needed in combining his water and earth chakra. Although his training time would be cut down because of the time he had to spend with his Jinan team. Speaking of which, at the end of the demonstration he thought he saw a flicker of determination in Ino that he hadn't seen before, 
Hopefully she was set on being a proper Kunoichi now. Kanako sunshined into the Hokaye's office slightly later than the rest of the team senseis. Although she was lazy to those with lower ranking than her, anything equal or above she tried not to be as late as she had been while acting as Kakashi. Team 1 Team 6 have failed Kakano, have yours? The Hokage asked rather irritably. In fact, no they didn't, the past, if only just, but I will need to talk to you more later, Kakano said, surprising the majority of the Jounin senseis. Must have been the Uchiha, one remarked, and although a few nodded, those that had spent time in the Anbu or training Naruto knew it wasn't. Team 8 Team 8 passed, although there are certain things I need to clarify, but apart from that it shouldn't be any problem, Kurana said, from over against the wall next to Anko. As Team 9 is still in circulation under Guy, Team 10 Team 10 passed, although I don't understand why you didn't give me Eno, but clearing up the fangirl shouldn't be too difficult. Asuma grunted before turning back to annoy Kurenai. In that case you can all leave apart from Kakano, who wanted to talk about something. The Hokage directed. After the others had left Hokage turned back to Kakano. Alright, what is it you have to tell me? Hokage-sama, it is clear that Ichiha Sasuke is jealous of the power that Naruto is displaying and unless we tell him the truth soon, he will become even more of a flight risk than he already is. Also he doesn't fit well with anyone else in my team, so I am considering putting him in the reserves. But if I do that then he becomes even more likely to try and abandon Konoha. And if we put him with a private tutor, with orders to try and teach him as little as possible, then he will quickly grow frustrated, Kakano reported, as she knew that having Sasuke on her team would be a clear negative impact, but trying to keep him loyal was important too. Hmm, we will keep him on your team for the moment, but if he steps over the line, bring the hammer down on him, understood? Hiruzen outlined. Perfectly. Hokage-sama. Good. Now I have to get back to paperwork, which, even with my shadow clones working on it at the same time, is rather tedious. Training Ground 7? 7? 7.30, the next morning. Ino and Sasuke came to the training ground to see hundreds of Naruto's doing various training exercises, some were balancing scene buns on their fingers, others were doing taijutsu sparring, others were practicing sword katas, others seemed to be writing or drawing, they couldn't tell. Sasuke clenched his teeth angrily before shouting, which one of you is the real Dobi? All of the clones pointed towards Naruto, who was in the middle of all the different groups, and seemed to be meditating, while sitting on top of a miniature hurricane, with his chakra wings stretched out behind him. Ino looked on in awe, he looked so serene, and if he could do that then he must be really strong. Sasuke, meanwhile, just stopped up to him only for Naruto to open his eyes and release his chakra. He then stepped down off of the hurricane and his wings flared brightly before he said, Such negative emotion is unbecoming of a shinobi, Uchiha. The coldness in his voice made Ina shiver. It reaffirmed her conclusion that Naruto wasn't someone you wanted to piss off, which Sasuke just did. You have no right to demand any of my techniques, and you definitely shouldn't piss me off, as you have no idea exactly what I am capable of. I have every right, as the last of the Uchiha and heir of the Uchiha clan, Konoha's greatest clan, so I demand you give me all your techniques, Sasuke arrogantly proclaimed. Ino cringed. Due to your arrogance and your attitude, you are currently the member of this team that has the least potential. And your clan was a clan of thieves and liars, stealing other people's hard work in desperation for power. Naruto's voice grew even colder, and Ino felt as if she was in a blizzard. Ha! As if you would know anything about the greatness of the founding clans of Konoha. Your mother was probably some drunk whore who didn't know who the father this was all Sasuke managed to get out before a fist drove into his stomach and he was launched into, and through, three trees. He fell to the ground after the third tree and caused a small crater. He was so injured that he couldn't move his head, and he could do nothing but watch as Naruto appeared above him and began raining blows down on his body. Sai who had just arrived heard a massive crash and he ran forward to see Ino screaming in horror as Naruto was beating the life from Sasuke. He immediately ran forward, knowing that if he didn't stop Naruto Sasuke would definitely die, and restrained Naruto. After calming Naruto, till he agreed to stop killing Sasuke at least, he sent an ink messenger bird to Kaneko to explain the situation while he took Sasuke to the hospital using a huge ink eagle. After they had left Naruto continued to vent his rage on the surrounding trees, as his clones had all finally dispersed and Ino was well out of harm's way. He smashed through quite a few, and Ino just watched in awe and sadness as he continued to punch his fists through tree trunk after tree trunk. Awe because she didn't think he was using any chakra to enhance his strikes and sadness because she could see how much he suffered not knowing any family. No wonder he regards his close friends as his brothers and sisters, she thought, he must be desperate to know what the feeling of family is like. Kanako turned up around 10 minutes later and simply looked at the destruction Naruto had wrought before turning to Ino, 
who was beside her. So what happened? We came in and found Naruto training with hundreds of what looked like clones, and Sasuke got jealous and went up to the real one and began to demand that he give all of his techniques as his right as the last of the Uchiha. Naruto then called the Uchiha clan a bunch of thieves and liars that steal other people's hard work. Sasuke in response called Naruto's mother a whore, and Naruto snapped, and sent Sasuke flying through three trees with one punch. Ino said, sad that neither of her teammates could get along. I knew it would be something along those lines, Kanako sighed, you see, that's about the only insult that can anger Naruto that much, everything else just makes him judge you as weak. Once he calms down, go ahead and ask him to help train you, as he calms down pretty quickly when he's trying to help others. Ino nodded, before Kanako told her that she had to go to the hospital and check in on Sasuke. Much as she thought he was a spoiled brat, she knew that after seeing Naruto getting that angry, he would be injured for quite a long time, though she doubted it would be permanent. Entering the hospital reception she saw Sai leaning on the wall next to a quarter and walked over to him stiffly. How is he? He merely shook his head and said that she'd better see for himself. He then walked with her down the corridor and stopped outside of room 23. Kanako paled. Room 23 was the pending room for potential long-term patients. Sai opened the door and let her through the door first. She walked into the room to see Tsunade writing notes on a clipboard, and as soon as she saw Tsunade, the head of the hospital, she knew it was bad. How bad is it? She asked the senin. On a scale of 1 to 10 with 10 being the worst, I would rate it about a 9 to 9 and a half. Naruto really did a number on the kid. Any idea why he did? According to Yamanaka Ino, who was there at the time, Sasuke called Naruto's mother a whore, Kanako said, wincing at the last part. Well, that I can understand, Tsunade said understandingly. Do you know how long he's going to be in here for? Definitely a year at least. Ouch. Ino had been taught by Naruto for a duration of 15 minutes so far and she had already worked out that he was a bit of a training freak. If he wasn't talking about training, then he was muttering about his projects and if he wasn't doing that, then he was shouting at her about her training. For the past few minutes she had been attempting the tree climbing exercise while Naruto was writing up a training schedule for her. She could walk up the tree, she just didn't have the amount of chakra necessary for staying up there for a long time and, as such, Naruto told her to do it until he said stop. Naruto, meanwhile was giggling at the thought of Ino's face when she saw her training schedule, he had finally made up his mind, when he got to Jounin, he was definitely going to train a group of genins just so he could torture them in training, as his senseis had done to him. Five minutes later he told Ino to stop and grab a drink before coming over to where he was sitting, which Ino did all too gratefully. Coming over she accepted the schedule and looked over it, and proceeded to almost choke on the water she had been swallowing, before the flash of a camera blinded her. She then, after recovering from her coughing fit, asked Naruto whether he was insane, to which he just cackled evilly. Two hours later Kanako and Sai arrived back at the training ground, having had to go to the Hokage's office to explain why Sasuke would be in the hospital for the next year and a half. Hiruzen had been about to give Naruto endless D ranks for six months but realized that Naruto had quite successfully delayed his problem of Sasuke being a flight risk, so he let him off. But he did say that Naruto would have to go to Mikado and explain why he had put her son in hospital for the next 18 months. Both Naruto and Ino accepted the news quite happily when Kanako announced that their team would therefore be comprised of Ino, Sai, and Naruto. Since Ino would be the only one learning the basics they would be able to get through them relatively quickly and move on to more advanced stuff. It also made it more likely that they would be competing in the Chunin exams in six months. For the past three months Kanako's team had been primarily training Ino up to standard with the rest of the team, which was incredibly hard as Sai was at least high Jounin level and Naruto was almost cage level. They were aiming to do the minimum required number of missions completed in order to enter the Chunin exams in three months and only had one C rank mission remaining in order to be able to qualify. As they returned tour to Madame Shijimi, the daimyo's wife, Kanako notified the Hokage that they were here for a C rank, although Team 8 happened to be there at the same time, asking for the exact same thing. As there was only one C rank available at the time Naruto suggested that they both did it, before Kanako and Kurana got into a fight. The Hokage seemed happy with the idea and agreed, before asking for Tezuna, the client, to be shown in. Hick, what is this? I asked for ninja not a bunch of snot-nosed brats and their mommies, Tezuna made his entrance by generally insulting everyone in the two teams but none more so than Kanako and Sai, who never knew their mothers. Sai to Tazana mentioned this with a suggestion that he doesn't do it again as Sai held his tanto to Tazana's throat. Thankfully for Tazana, Kakano ordered Sai to stand down before he drew blood. Kakano had been given overall command of the mission, as she had more experience than Kurana did, 
and she told both teams to be at the West Gate out of Konoha in three hours prepared for a three-week-long mission at the very least. Three hours later West Gate, Naruto was the first member of the mission to be at the meeting point as he was ten minutes early, and with nothing better to do he pulled out his trusty violin and began to play. The song reminded all that heard of leaving, saying goodbye, and arriving as the other members of the mission arrived they stayed quiet, knowing that listening to the violin would provide them with entertainment until they left. That is, until Kiba arrived. Everyone apart from Kiba, Kanako and Tazuna had arrived and were waiting. Kiba arrived quietly but what stopped Naruto playing was when he realized that Kiba was trying to get Kuranai to go on a date with him. Eyes flashing with anger, he walked up behind Kiba and hit him very hard on the head, before saying, I really do hope you are not harassing my Nechan Kiba, because if you are, I will have to teach you what happens to those who harass my friends. It is very painful. Why the hell are you calling her Nechan anyway? It's not like you're related or anything. After all you are just an orphan, Kiba said obstinately, not knowing the line he had stepped across. Ino, Sai, Kurinai and the newly arrived Kanako winced as they saw Naruto's eyes flash murderously. All four of them had to restrain Naruto from beating Kiba into hospital, as they needed him to complete the mission. After Kanako and Sai had managed to calm Naruto down, and Kurinai explained to her team not to piss Naruto off, and explained the incident with Sasuke a few months ago. Kakano told every member of the two teams minus the Jounin to tell her what was in their packs, although Team 7 had their equipment sealed into scrolls. Thankfully she didn't have to head out replacement packs, and so they set off. The entire company was bored for the first few hours as there was nothing to look at apart from trees, although Kakano was reading her smut and Naruto was reading the history of the first shinobi war to see if it had any clues about the Makuten techniques the Sha Daim Hokage used. Eventually though Ino asked Tazana why Wave didn't have any ninja and they got into a conversation that everyone ended up listening to. Well we once had a very good relationship with a ninja village on a nearby island off the coastline. But it was destroyed several decades ago, Kazuna said. What was the village called? Ino asked curiously, as this was the first time she had heard of such a village. It was Azushiogakur no Sato, a village famed for its skills in Kenjutsu and Fuu and Jutsu, that was destroyed by a combined attack from Iwa and Kumo just before the Second Shinobi War. Thus starting said Shinobi War, Naruto spoke up, remembering that he was descended from this village. It was also Konoha's ally before it was destroyed. Obviously Konoha still remembers its allies, Kazuna said, before continuing, but I would have expected Shinobi about your sensei's age to remember, not a child of twelve. So what connection do you have with the island? My mother was the only Uzumaki survivor of the attack, but she died a few years ago, as such, I am the last Uzumaki, Naruto said proudly, but at the same time, sadly, I don't see what's so great about this village, I mean, if they were wiped out. Then obviously they were pretty weak, right? Kiba couldn't help but voice his opinion, and try and put Naruto down. Kiba, if Iwa and Kumo hadn't lost so many shinobi wiping out the Uzumaki, then Konoha would have lost the third shinobi war, Yondame Hokage or not. To this day Konoha remembers their failure at helping the Uzumaki. The swirl of Azushio is on many of the Chunin flak jackets, and can even be seen in the leaf on your hideate. Konoha remembers that they could not save their sister village, a village that was also highly influential on the founding of Konoha itself. It was the Uzumaki that signed the peace agreement between the Senju and Uchiha, and they modeled Konoha's shinobi ranks off that of the Uzumaki, Naruto said, making many of the Jinan look at their hideates. I bet you're making half of that up to make them seem important, Kiba refused stubbornly. It's the truth, Kiba. Hashirama, the shot I'm Hokage, was married to a Uzumaki. Called Mito Uzumaki who was the greatest Fu and Jutsu user in history, although Naruto is getting very close, Kanako sighed, before I smiling at the end. Kiba just huffed and continued walking. Two hours later the trees began to disappear and grasslands started to dot their surroundings. All of the shinobi were on a higher guard than before, they could feel the uneasy quiet around them, and even Tazuna could feel it. Up ahead, the two Jounin and Team 7 saw what was obviously a Genjutsu, and a very poor one too. They all glanced at each other and nodded agreeing that they would see how this played out. Team 8 knew that something was amiss, as their different bloodlines were geared towards tracking, but hadn't caught sight of the puddle. As such the company walked past the puddle peacefully. The company turned to the side of Kanako and Kuranai being shredded by a shuriken chain. Team 8, apart from Shino, panicked, while Team 7 remained calm, as they knew that the Jounin had queer-rimied at the last moment, as shown by the splinters of wood left on the ground. Two piggies down, six more to go and then we can kill the bridge builder, one of the two assailants chanted in an almost smug tone as they charged to the Jinan. Naruto immediately moved forward, as did Sai, 
as the ones closest to the two attackers were Kiba and Hinata. And although Naruto was still annoyed by the disparaging remarks that Kiba had made, he was still one of Konoha Ninja, therefore he was obligated to save his life if necessary. Unsheathing an Ninjato in his right hand and pushing Kiba to one sword with his left he blocked the chain and punched his opponent in the stomach, launching the missing Nin back and having the extra effect of staggering Sai's opponent, as they were still connected by the chain. Confident that they could deal with their opponents as they only looked to Janan, Naruto's opponent released the chain from his gauntlet before attacking Sai to allow his friend to do the same. Naruto just watched calmly as Sai went on the defensive, knowing that if necessary he could deal with both missing nins, before deciding that he would just handle them quickly to allow Ino to interrogate them by mind walking. Sneaking up behind the two missing nin he used the pommel of his sword to knock out one, distracting the other one and allowing Sai to kill him. Pulling out a bingo book as Kakano and Kurinai reappeared, he quickly found them and called out to Kakano. Nechan. These two are the famed demon brothers, Chunin level missing nins from Kariga Kour, who are soon to be dead. Ino, can you mind walk the unconscious one to see if they have company? Hearing the affirmative, the company settled down to have a break while Ino was mind walking through the mind of the missing nin and Kakano was grilling Tazana about lying in the mission contract. You are lucky there are two teams on this mission, and that one of them contains Naruto and Sai, Kanako berated quietly. Unfortunately Kiba picked up on the last part. What's so great about Naruto and Sai, not to sound disrespectful, but they're just Janan aren't they? Kiba knew that he owed Naruto his life, so he tried not to insult him. Due to certain circumstances, both of them had received training that is higher than an Anbu. The Naruto you knew at the academy was just a clone that was told to act stupid so that people would underestimate him. Both have vast experience in the field as both have worked with the Anbu Black Ops on certain occasions all of which are classified. The reasons for this is classified too, although it will be revealed during the finals at the Chunin exam, as due to the knee laws that the Sandaime made, it is impossible to skip Shinobi ranks. Along with the fact that he wants to make a lot of publicity for Konoha, Kanako explained after cursing her big mouth, she shouldn't have mentioned it at all. All of the Janan looked at Naruto and Sai, who were watching out for Ino, in awe. The thought that someone their age had been on a bunch of highly classified missions was awe-inspiring. A few minutes after this revelation Ino came back out from walking the mindscape of the second of the demon brothers, having found the information that she was looking for. She then sat down and accepted a drink of water from Kanako, while Naruto was cutting of the heads of the demon brothers. Alright, the demon brothers are two of a group of four missing nin that are working for Gato, who wants the bridge builder eliminated. The other two are Momochi Zabuza, the demon of the hidden mist, and someone they just know as Haku. I looked through their memories and apparently Haku can use ice techniques and was also trained as a hunter nin. Ino explained briefly after gulping down some water. However the demon brothers were just used to see what our strengths were, as they knew that Haku was watching from the nearby tree line. Gato also mentioned a group of missing nin from Amigakura that he would hire if Zabuza's group weren't up to the task. In that case it is likely that Zabuza himself will have a go before we reach Tazuna's house. We will camp here for the night and finish the journey tomorrow. It would be a bad idea to be walking into a potential ambush after sundown. We will have a guard shift through the night, as thankfully there are eight of us, meaning four shifts of two. First will be Naruto and Kiba then Hinata and Shino, Ino and Sai, and me and Kurinai, Kakano outlined. One last thing Sensei, one of the missing nins from Ame was called Aoi Rokusho. I thought that it might be of some relevance, Ino said as the others began to wander off to bed. Naruto's eyes sparked with this information as Aoi Rokusho was a traitor to Konoha, and also possessed an heirloom from his family. The next day all were woken up by Kakano and Kurinai, and they began traveling to the Land of Waves once more. Halfway through that they came to the shoreline of the Land of Fire and Tazuna directed them to where a man with a paddleboat was waiting anxiously to ferry them across. Tazuna, I cannot take them all at once, and I will not make two journeys, as Tazuna was trying to find a way to answer, as he didn't want to lose half of the shinobi guarding him. Kanako turned to Naruto. Can you make another boat using your Uzumaki bloodline? Naruto studied the boat intently before nodding. He then moved a few meters away down the shoreline and sat down on the sand, palms in front of him. He then began to channel intense chakra. Everyone turned to watch what he was doing and Kiba opened his mouth to speak before Kanako stopped him, saying quietly, Hush, he needs to concentrate. The teams, disbelieving apart from Kanako, Kurinai, and Sai. Watched as Naruto molding his chakra in an exact replica of the boat beside them, or isn't all. A quick burst of chakra later, and there was an exact copy of the first boat in front of Naruto, who reached into a pocket on his vest for a chakra pill. He then came over and said, 
We will travel with Taz and I in this boat while Kur and I's team follows us across using the secondary boat. Kur and I walked over to the boat before stepping into it, as if it was a completely normal occurrence. As the two boats set off into the mist Kiba whispered to Kur and I. What was that? I have never seen that much chakra before, and didn't know it could be used to create solid objects. It can't, not normally anyway. The ability is the Uzumaki bloodline, and it allows them to create fully functioning objects purely from their chakra, as theirs is slightly different from that of normal ninja. It's why Naruto is able to attach wings to his back using his chakra and fly above Konoha, she replied, but the best part about it is that they are able to reabsorb the chakra they spend creating the object after they finish using it which is why this boat is only temporary. Kiba and the others of Team 8 were stunned by the usefulness of such a bloodline. Of course, it has its limitations, as does every bloodline, it cannot create food or living things, only those that are dead. Likewise it cannot create metals for crafting or smithing as the purity needed is almost impossible to gain, although as can create already crafted metal that has been molded into an item, Kurin I said, knowing that all bloodlines have their limits and can only get one so far. An hour and a half later they arrived on the beaches of the Land of Wave. Having seen the gargantuan size of the bridge that Tazanai is building on their way there, Naruto repeated the process that he had taken on the shoreline of the Land of Fire, simply in reverse, reabsorbing all the chakra he had spent initially. While this did increase the size of his chakra network, which should have debilitated him, thankfully Kyari was using her chakra to protect the walls of his network and allowing it to happen without notice from his body. As Tazana watched the boatman row off into the mist once more, the ninja were preparing themselves for the encounter with Zabuza that would undoubtedly happen soon. Kanako-sensei, I request permission to be the one which engages Zabuza. Naruto was known to be serious by all as they heard the mode of address he used for Kanako. The boy was silent for a moment as Kanako considered the request, before pressing his case. We know that he cannot beat me in either ninjutsu of kenjutsu, which are likely to be his two main strengths, and if he presses in taijutsu, I can definitely match him even if he has the advantage in strength and size. I will have the advantage in speed. Kanako thought for a moment more before nodding silently. Naruto was best suited to take on the A-ranked missing nin, as he was an S-ranked nin already in the bingo book, due to his exploits as Konoha's deathly angel over his supposed academy years. Add to that the fact that Naruto could beat Zabuzai in his greatest strengths, and it was pretty much game over for the former Kiri shark captain. Naruto placed himself next to Tazuna as the group walked quietly down the wide dirt road. When the mist began to set and the shinobi all began to tense. Game on. Seeing a presence through the mist, Hinata quickly threw a kunai towards a nearby tree. Kiba, checking to see what it was, came back with a kunai and a terrified white rabbit. Team 7 and the Jounin, on seeing the rabbit, immediately knew that it was a kwa Urimi, as the rabbit's fur indicated that it had been raised inside a house. Naruto ears picked up the sound of a heavy object passing through the air. Woomp, woomp woomp, get down. The shout rang from four different throats, those of Naruto, Kanako, Sai, and Kurinai. They ducked just in time to avoid being cut in half by what looked to be a massive sword, which proceeded to be lodged in a tree behind the group. After checking that everyone had indeed managed to get down in time, the group looked up at the man now balancing on the massive hilt sticking out beside the tree the blade was buried in. Momochi Zabuza, missing nin of Kirigakur, wanted for attempting to assassinate the Ondaime Mizukage, renowned as the Demon of the Hidden Mist and later one of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, Kanako said as she watched Zabuza carefully. Hitake Kanako, the woman said to have copied a thousand jutsu with her Sharingan, to the point where she is known as Sharingan Kanako. I must say, I was surprised to hear that you were a woman, after all those years being known as a man. Fighting you will be fun, Zabuza said in a condescending voice as he looked over the Konoha Jinan. It won't be me you're fighting, but him, Kanako replied, pointing to Naruto. Ha! You expect a Janan to beat me, I thought you shinobi from Konoha disliked the idea of needless sacrifice, Zabuza crowed, thinking that Kanako had lost her nerve. I requested to fight you, Zabuza, after all, I do like sparring fellow Kenjutsu masters, Naruto said, drawing his twin ninjutos, which now had seal along the blades towards the hilt. If you requested to fight me, then who am I to deny your wish? Zabuza asked rhetorically before forming hand seals for a jutsu. Water style, hidden mist jutsu. Almost instantly the battlefield was covered in a dense mist that was almost impossible to see through. Naruto silently released some of his chakra weights down to level 2 out of 20, they had been at level 9. And completely took off his 5 layers of resistance seals. The result being that Naruto would be a complete blur to anything other than a 3 Tomoe Sharingan. There is no point Zabuzai in using the hiding technique, I can still sense your chakra, and it seems you're in the process of making a water clone, 
Naruto announced, confident that he would win, as his skills countered or beat Zabuza's own. Meanwhile Zabuza was cursing internally, he loathed sensor ninjas, especially ones that could actually do some damage, as they completely nullified the usefulness of his favorite technique. He therefore abandoned the jutsu, as it was now just wasting him chakra. The mist slowly dissipated to reveal Zabuza standing on top of the water of the river that separated the land of waves from the mainland. Well now that you can see me, perhaps it's time to introduce myself and see if you know who I am. And with that rather relaxed statement Naruto flared his chakra into the form of two wings. Shocking Tezuna, Zabuza and watchers that were hidden in the trees. What the hell is Konoha's deathly angel doing here? In fact what is Konoha doing here? Killer B thought in his head. He and his team of Amoe, Karu, Samui and Yugito had received a contract from the Land of Waves to protect a certain bridge builder from being killed. And it seems Konoha had too, and although he didn't like to deal with Konoha unless absolutely necessary, he didn't like the idea of going back to Kumo with a failed mission either. Let's see how this plays out. Either we will have to deal with Momochi Zabuza or we will have to deal with Konoha. Although this should be a good chance to see how good this kid really is. Back on the water Zabuza was sputtering in disbelief. Konoha's deathly angel is a Jinan? Zabuza couldn't contain his horror, turning to Kanako. Yep. Kanako gave him a thumbs up and an eye smile. I did most of my missions while a blood clone took my place at the academy and acted like a complete Tobi, Naruto said, how he loved messing with people's heads. But the first sighting of you was three years ago, which means that you were on a mission in Kiri, which was a battleground at the time, at around the age of nine. Zabuza was now pointing comically at the utterly relaxed Naruto. Yep same as Sai. Naruto chirped at Sai, who was by now insanely bored and had gone back to drawing. Oh shit, come on, I don't think I am able to take Konoha's Deathly Angel, Konoha's Panther, Sharingan Kanako and Konoha's Genjutsu Mistress, Zabuza shouted at himself internally but his sense of pride won out and he readied his familiar blade. Ah the Kubi Karabocho, so it seems this will be a Kenjutsu match then? Naruto asked readjusting his grip on his twin ninjutos. The two simply stared at each other for the next few minutes, the tension between becoming almost physical as the two worked up their adrenaline systems unconsciously. Then a leaf flew across Naruto's field of vision and the next thing all the spectators knew he had his ninjutos blocked by Zabuza's sword as Zabuza went on the defensive. Holy shit he's fast, I barely got Kubi Karabocho up in time to stop myself from being cut in half. Zabuza thought wordly as he and Naruto looked into each other's eyes. Naruto then moved backwards a few paces before intoning gravely, Uzumaki style, dance of the bloody thorns and roses. Zabuza's eyes widened as Naruto then began to spin elegantly into forms, each one whirling around his frame, only making small cuts. But Zabuza saw a flaw that he could exploit and swung Kubi Karabocha straight at what he thought was Naruto to get him to stop attack. What he didn't expect was for Naruto to roll over the blade and inflict deeper cuts on his right arm right side of his torso, right thigh, and right calf. Zabuza hastily retreated, and cursed himself for his carelessness, it seemed that the tendons in his right arm and right leg had been cut, impairing his mobility and his ability to wield his blade. Naruto grinned, about to go in for the killing move when Senban sprouted from Zabuza's neck, ice Senbans. Which meant that Zabuza's accomplice, this Haku, was a Yuki clan member, Naruto's eyes widened at the implications, he could use this to perhaps recruit the two into Konoha's forces. Thank you for your assistance in allowing me to deal with this missing nin, Konoha nin, Naruto turned at the rather young and melodious voice. Kiri hunter nin mask, check. Kiri style of dress, check. Age, no. It was my pleasure, hunter nin. Unfortunately Naruto and the Konoha group had other issues to deal with, and Naruto knew that the injury Zabuza would keep out of action for at least two weeks, even with a skilled healer. So he let the hunter nin take Zabuza away, and returned to where his teammates were standing, before turning to the forest to the right of the group and telling the ninjas hiding there to come out. The Kumo nin looked at each other before Killer B shrugged and leapt into the open. Kanako, Kurinai and Sai looked at them with passive faces, concealing their surprise, while Ino, Kiba. Hinata and Shino couldn't control their reactions. What are you here for brother of the Reikage and fellow Kumonin? Naruto asked in an even tone. It seems that there was a mission request to protect a certain bridge builder sent to two different shinobi villages, said one of the Kumo Kunoichi, who had blonde hair and a ponytail. At this everyone looked at Tazuna, who began to sweat before saying, perhaps we can deal with this at the house. Now that's an idea, yo! The large man with sunglasses rapped, badly. Shut the hell up B. The same Kunoichi shouted. The Konoha Jounin got the feeling that they would have a very large headache soon. 45 minutes later the now completely dysfunctional group arrived at Tazana's house, 
with everyone having varying levels of a headache apart from Naruto, Sai and Killer B. The former two had just tuned everything out, while the latter was the one annoying everyone else. Thankfully he had stopped his rapping the closer they got to the house as he tried to think of what his team could offer to the Konoha Shinobi that they didn't already have. With the presence of 4A or S-class nins, they already had this situation well in hand, his team wouldn't be able to do much. But he figured that he would be able to work something out with the two Jounin from Konoha. Meanwhile the Kumo team were regarding the Konoha Shinan warily, especially Naruto and Sai, who were walking right behind Tezuna and talking animatedly about the various aspects of art, of all things. Samui was wondering how they grew so powerful and what might be the best ways to perhaps constrain them if necessary. Kuro was wondering what made them so special to have been trained so early, while Yugito was thinking about sparring Naruto. Amoe was overthinking things again as he wondered what their rakage would say if saw them cooperating with Konoha and if he would exile them for it. Tsunami, I'm home. They heard the sounding of rapid feet before the door opened quickly. Dad? You're back. And, you did bring a lot of ninja back with you. She said in a slightly hesitant tone at the end as she regarded the various looks of the ninja standing in front of her house. Well, there seems to have been a bit of confusion. Eyebrows of many of the shinobi rose slightly at this before Tazana continued, but I am sure we can figure something out. All of the shinobi then followed Tazana into the house apart from B, Kakano and Kuranai, who stayed outside in order to figure out what they were going to do in regards to the organization of the mission. In the house, the shinobi of the two different villages were regarding one another carefully before Kiba burst out, why the hell are we working with Kumo Nin anyway? I mean, weren't we enemies? Just because we were enemies during and after the third shinobi war, doesn't mean we are currently. That is the way of the shinobi world, those that are your enemies now may one day be your friends, spoke Naruto in a clam tone, and don't get me started on you, what the hell was that about you and Sai being Konoha's deathly angel whatever it was? Kiba demanded, turning on him. The Kumo Shinan just watched unbemusedly. Naruto sighed heavily before bringing out his bingo book and telling Kiba to go to page 34 before handing it to him. Kiba did so, with Hinata and Shino reading over his shoulders, Konoha's deathly angel, name, unknown, ninjutsu, SS ranked abilities on ninjutsu, able to hold his own with some of the best in the field, kenjutsu, SS ranked, able to defeat members of the seven swordsmen of the mist with ease, master of the Uzumaki styles and dances, taijutsu, S ranked. Able to defeat an outlast Maito guy, Konoha's Daijutsu master, created his own style, able to adapt to any situation. Genjutsu, A ranked, able to defeat and outcompare most in the field of Genjutsu, but it is his weakest field. Fuu and Jutsu, SS ranked, reportedly a sealing master better than Jiraiya of the Senin, able to use seals in the midst of battle by drawing them in mid-air. Bloodlines, has the Uzumaki bloodline to make temporary solid objects through his chakra alone. Seem to has an unknown bloodline allowing him to mix his affinities. Age, unknown. Associates, typically seen cooperating with his partner, Konoha's Panther, or Sharingan Kaneko. Trained from an early age by some of Konoha's best shinobi, but reason for this is unknown. First sighting, midst of the Kiri bloodline purged three years ago, Battle of Bone Fires where he and a team of Konoha's Anbu held off over 20 enemy Nin and 50 mercenaries while other teams were evacuating Kaguya survivors from the clan compound created two solid wings connected to his back while fighting subconsciously. S-ranked approach with supreme caution as this shinobi is approaching the rank of SS, which only a few members in history have ever held, the most recent being the Yondame Hokage. Kiba looked up as he finished reading before saying, holy shit. In his shock, the bingo book fell from his grasp and the red-headed Kumo Kunoichi made an attempt to catch it, no doubt to read the contents, but before she could do so Naruto's hand snatched it out of the air. And he quickly put it back in his pocket smiling slightly. A few moments later the door to the living room in which they were all gathered, rattled open as Kakano, Kuranai and B all walked in smiling. The Jinan all looked at them curiously before Kakano decided to explain. We decided that neither group wanted to go back to their village without a completed mission report so we decided that we may as well complete this mission together. So now that that has been decided, we may as well give introductions. As Konoha has two teams present we will go first, I am Hatake Kakano. Jounin Sensei of Team 7, Yamanaka Ino, of Team 7, Sai of Team 7, Uzumaki Naruto of Team 7, Yuhi Kuranai, Jounin Sensei of Team 8, Aburame Shino of Team 8, Inuzu Kakiba of Team 8, Hayuga Hinata of Team 8. The Kumo Nin glanced at one another, before Killer B decided to set the example. Killer B, Jounin Leader of Team 3, Niyugito, of Team 3, Amoi of Team 3, Kuro of Team 3, Samui of Team 3. Well, now that we all know others, 
How about we go spar and see how we stand with our shinobi brothers and sisters? B managed to create a clear meaning in his sentence while rapping, although the fact that he was rapping in the first place annoyed the hell out of everyone. Kanako sighed, but agreed that it was necessary to be able to formulate a plan properly, even if she would have liked to try and keep some of their abilities secret. Several minutes later in a rather large clearing in the middle of the forest, and away from prying eyes, the shinobi gathered to debate who should spar who in the opposing teams. Perhaps we should have free-for-all spar between one person from each team? Kanako suggested, getting annoyed at the arguments some of the Jinan were putting up about wanting to fight certain people. But my team has extra, who gonna fight her? Killer B rapped as he pointed at Yugito. I am sure that Naruto will be happy to fight two rounds, am I right Naruto? Kuren I asked, only to receive no response. All three Jounin turned to see Naruto casually reading a book as Kiba was trying to shake him out of it. Kuren I immediately turned to Kanako and said, he was infected. I knew it would happen if he started to hang around you too long. Naruto. Kanako called, breaking him out of the trance he had entered, and repeated the question. Yeah, sure why not? It should be fun. Naruto shrugged before going back to reading. All of the Jounin rolled their eyes, although B finally got a sense of how annoying his rapping was, he shrugged mentally. He didn't care. Kiba, Karu, and Ino, Kanako called the three forward from the rest gathered at one side of the clearing. All right, this is just a spar, we want no long-term injuries or deaths, if you're in a position where it's do something dangerous, die, or quit, just quit, it makes things easier without people having to waste medical supplies because of your stupidity, Kanako outlined briefly before bringing her hand down with a cry of Hajime and starting the spar. Ino considered the other two briefly before moving quickly using a shunshine with one hand seal, impressing the Kumo team along with Kuranai's team. Now out of immediate sight of the other two, Ino considered her plan of attack. Back out in the open, Kiba was desperately trying to avoid being hit by Kuro's buken, as all blades had been replaced by them in order not to injure anyone, although everyone had agreed that if they were hit in a kill point by one, they must immediately quit. Backing up quickly Kiba called out the name of his technique as Akamaru readied himself beside him. Fang passing Fang. Karo's eyes widened as she saw the two human-sized drills speeding towards her, and ducked at the last second, collapsing to the ground, the drills just missing her by inches. Kiba pulled out of the technique just as he was about to crash into the trees ahead of him. He turned to repeat the maneuver, only to find Kuro immediately in front of him with her bouquet pointing towards his heart. Kiba understood that he had lost moving out of the way to watch the remainder of the match. Ino was watching from above, as she had walked up a nearby tree while Kiba and Kuro were occupied with fighting each other. Seeing that Kiba was out, she sent a clone to distract Kuro momentarily. As Kuro turned to face the incoming clone, she didn't notice that it was just an illusion, as it wasn't touching the ground. As she did so, Ino dropped from the branches overhanging the clearing behind Kuro and tapped a pressure point in her neck, knocking her out smoothly. Over in the group of spectators, Kakano smiled, Ino had just won without revealing any of her techniques other than the one-hand seal shunshine, which was often disregarded as being ineffective by combat ninja. Kuranai and Killer B had just come to the same conclusion, realizing that this girl, and in essence Kanako's entire team, hated revealing their abilities unnecessarily. Shino, Samui, and Naruto, same deal as last time, no maiming or killing, don't do unnecessary damage. Kuranai said in an attempt to sound interested. Hajime. Both Shino and Samui looked at one another before nodding and turning to face Naruto, who ever so slowly withdrew his buken version of his ninjato, and holding it in one hand, began to do hand seals with the other. Everyone was shocked that he was able to do so, even Kanako and Sai, as it had just been a recent project of his. He called forth water that proceeded to surround his hand, making the eyes of everyone widen further still. Naruto had just called forth water from the air which only the Nidime Hokage was recorded of doing, and showed extreme control over it by wrapping around a limb without it losing its form. Samui and Shino charged in immediately determined to try and force Naruto out before he could get started. Unfortunately they were playing right into Naruto's hands, as when Samui tried to engage him at Daijutsu fight in order to cramp him from using his buken, he used the water that had been wrapped around his hand to douse her in water. Samui cursed as this meant she wouldn't be able to use any of her lightning ninjutsu without knocking herself out of the competition. Shino retreated somewhat, before sending a wave kikaiku towards Naruto. Seeing this Naruto gathered wind chakra around his hand to the point where it was almost visible before slamming his fist into the ground and releasing his wind chakra as he hit. The result was a massive amount of the kikaiku being launched into the air. Uzumaki-san, you have just given me an advantage, as all of my kikaiku have the ability to fly. Shino said briefly before telling his Kikaiku to attack. 
Naruto was only able to think of one technique that he could use to deter Shino without killing many of the Aburame's Kikaku. Hurricane style, Hurricane Sphere. Naruto created a sphere surrounding himself, comprising of layers of lightning, water, and wind. I suggest you forfeit Shino as none of your Kikaku will be able to pierce this sphere without being fried, drowned and cut to pieces, and I do not want to weaken you for the battle ahead. Naruto said, as he had worked out his personal ultimate defense technique. Shino paused, receiving messages from his Kikaiku telling that what Naruto said was correct. He thought silently for a few moments more, considering actions he could take in their outcomes, before he bowed his head and left the field. Naruto then deactivated his hurricane sphere before turning to Samui. As you are unable to use lightning ninjutsu, which is typically the primary elemental affinity type for those from Kumo, shall we make this a taijutsu match? Naruto asked smiling grimly and who said that lightning is my only elemental affinity samui had a sudden grin on her face before announcing water style water bullets she spat six high-powered bullets at naruto who seeing the hand side chain and guessing the technique was already performing a counter technique earth style earth rock wall samui just watched silently as her water bullets hit the earth wall ineffectively as the wall collapsed after it had been used samui eyed naruto just how many elemental affinities do you have she couldn't help but ask with slight exasperation. For, why? Naruto was oblivious to the sense of shock rising up from the Kumo Ninja. Never mind, it's just not cool to face a guy with four affinities, Samui sighed before moving in for Taijutsu. As she tried to get beneath Naruto guard, she could sense that Naruto was coddling her and allowing her to try and hit him. Naruto eventually got bored of the light exercise and struck a pair of pressure points on Samui's arms, rendering them useless. Samui then moved to try and kick the living daylights out of Naruto before he knocked her out. Talk about bloody troublesome, he thought, you immobilize her arms, and so she immediately tries to kick you instead. He then picked up the unconscious Samui and carried her over to the watching group. Was it really necessary to toy with him Naruto? Kakano asked in slight exasperation, she had expected the third spar to be well underway by now. I was bored, Naruto said briefly before he pulled his book back out and continued reading. Yugito tried to look at what he was reading and found that it wasn't Icha Icha, but instead it was a manual on sword crafting, of all things. The third round went as expected, with Hinata, due to her overly gentle and hesitant nature, being dealt with quickly by Amoe, but not before dealing some damage to him in the form of closing the tenkutsus of his left arm. Sai then repeated what Ino had done, accepting he drew endless ink animals, forcing Amoe to try and cut them down one by one as lightning didn't seem to have much effect. Eventually Sai was unable to keep up the pace he had formerly shown with his drawing, and Amoe forced him into a kenjutsu fight, with Sai using his taido against Amoe's katana. Although Amoe had the advantage of reach, it was effectively nullified once Sai began showing amazing displays of acrobatics in orders to get close in, even flipping over Amoe himself several times. The two Boken started to crack under the constant impact of the two fighting. Eventually it ended in a rather spectacular finish as Sai used his chakra to stick one of his hands on the side of Amoe's buchan and when Amoe drew back for a downward slash, released it, allowing Sai to get directly behind him and poise his buchan at Amoe's jugular. The Kumo Shinobi were rather depressed at this, as although each of them had beaten the Konoha Jinan from Kuranai's team, none of them had beaten any from Kanako's team. Although Karu was feeling the worst, as Samui and Amoe had lost to Jinan who were in the bingo book while she had just lost to a normal Jinan. By this stage Yugito was almost feeling jittery, and she wasn't exactly sure why, as she knew that Naruto wouldn't kill her, from what she had seen from his match against Samui. She just put it up to nerves. Oh please kitten, it's because you're excited to be fighting him, after from what I have seen from your reactions, you like him, Matatabi put her thoughts in helpfully. I do not like him, he is from Konoha, it wouldn't work, Yugito thought back. You sound like you have actually considered it, and I can see why. Matatabi responded, before sending Yugito mental images of her in front of a huge viewing screen watching Yugito's memories of Naruto. Yugito growled mentally, before blocking out Matatabi's voice to concentrate on the spar at hand. Naruto watched as various emotions ranging from denial to possessive want crossed Yugito's face, cementing his suspicion that she was a Jinchuriki. The odd chakra he had felt when he used his sensor abilities had been what initially made him suspect her. And even though Kyari had said that it was unlikely that a Jinchuriki could have such good control over their Baijuu's chakra, he had continued to suspect. Now that his suspicion was cemented he was also sure that Killer B was a Jinchuriki as well, although that was openly suggested due to the ox tattoo on his shoulder. He guessed that due to his Senju heritage they didn't know the same about him, so he made sure not to use Kyari's chakra. Although he had to put it out there, 
That look of possessive want that had crossed Yugita's face earlier had scared him, it was a mildly more controlled version of the same face that children make when they have something they absolutely want to play with. It scared even more that she had been looking directly at him when that look crossed his face. Naruto shivered, he just had a feeling that no matter what he did, Yugito getting her way would be unavoidable. Kanako watched in amusement as the two regarded each other, as did Kurunai and Killer B, the two were acting in a way no one had ever seen before, they were being skittish. Kanako ever so slowly bought a video camera out of her back pocket, she could use this so many things, blackmail, embarrassing Naruto telling her friends and having the evidence to back it up. Killer B and Kurunai, having caught on to what she was doing, came over and they all huddled in a group over the soon-to-be recording of Naruto's embarrassment. The two watched each other for the first minutes of their spar, waiting for the other person to make the first move, although Yugito was trying to block out Matatabi's suggestions. Eventually deciding that moving towards Naruto and into combat might be the only way to get Matatabi to shut up, Yugito moved first. She is surprisingly fast for a supposed Janan. It seems that Konoha isn't the only one that applies advanced training for those in unusual circumstances, Naruto thought as he blocked Yugito's Taijutsu attacks. Yugito seeing that she wasn't getting anywhere with her Taijutsu, retreated before preparing what seemed to be a fire style technique. Fire style, Grand Fireball Jutsu. To Naruto's shock it seemed to be hotter and much larger than the average Grand Fireball Jutsu. Must be a side effect of being a demon container for a certain demon, Naruto concluded as he shunshined out of the fireball's path. As he watched it hit the trees behind where he had been standing, he added another thought to that statement, I am so glad Sasuke isn't here, he would be seething with jealousy, might even start a war over it. Naruto ducked under the bouquet that was swung by Yugito and he moved behind her in an attempt to knock her out with the pommel of his own. It didn't work, as Yugito did the strangest thing one could do in the middle of spar, she collapsed into Naruto, causing him to miss and the two of them to fall over with Yugito on top. Everyone's eyes grew wide, apart from Samui and Karu. Who knew what Yugito was doing? Kanako giggled perversely as she caught it on camera. Naruto quickly set down Yugito on the grass gently, before attempting to wake her up, he thought that she had collapsed from stress or something. Then he realized what she was attempting and quickly backed off before she could try anything. Yugito, what the hell are you trying to do? Damn it! Yugito cursed softly before shun shining out of sight. Naruto activated his chakra wings again. He didn't want a sense where Yugito was as this was turning out to be a rather enjoyable match. That's what the three Jounin watching thought as well. Naruto's eyes widened as two grand fireballs streaked towards him from two opposite directions, and he was in the middle. Kurunai's team panicked when he didn't move as the fireballs got closer and closer to him. Naruto's wings just curled around him and transparent chakra appeared in the places they didn't cover. The flames impacted before slowly dying down. Naruto was standing exactly as he had been with what looked to be a shell of protective chakra around him, flaring gold from the heat of the two fireballs. He then released the chakra, apart from that which kept his wings and said quietly, You should remember Yugito that I am a sensor ninja, you can't hide from me. Yugito had just processed these words, knowing that she would have to come out and fight, when the pommel of Naruto's bouquet impacted with her temple and knocked her out. The Naruto that was in the clearing then moved underneath the branch she had been squatting on and caught her before she could impact with the ground. He then ordered a shadow clone to dispel, before carrying over Yugito's unconscious body to the crowd of spectators. It was only after Naruto had handed over Yugito to Samui that he caught sight of the thing that Kanako was hurriedly trying to hide within one of the pockets of her vest. It was a portable video camera. Nei-chan, what is that you're trying to hide in your vest? Naruto asked in an overly sweet, but icy calm tone. It's nothing. I forgot to bring batteries for it, Kanako shuddered. Naruto knew there were no batteries within Kanako's supplies as he had checked them before they left Konoha. He hadn't checked Kanako's vest though. Good, Naruto said in the same tone before walking off. Yes. All three Jounins thought simultaneously, mentally fist pumping at the thought of such useful blackmail material. Kanako had made an agreement with Killer B that they would share such material in order to embarrass each other's students. It had been two days since the spars between the teams and both Kurunai's team and the Kumo had been training like crazy. Everyone had agreed that they would have a similar sort of spar before they went home, although the event everyone was keen for was the Chunin exams, as everyone had agreed to compete. Naruto and Sai were currently the ones guarding Tazuna as he continued construction of the bridge. Tazuna. One of the workers came over, looking rather anxious. What is it Yaro? Tazuna had taken notice of his nervous state. I don't think I will be able to work on the bridge any longer, Yaro said hesitantly. This caught Naruto's attention from where he was sitting over to one side. What? But we agreed that we would finish this bridge no matter what it took, 
Tazanaw was shocked at the sudden resignation of one of his most faithful workers, but Gutta will kill us for it. Is this act of defiance worth our lives? Yaro objected, I will not be cowed by Gato. Tazana turned to the rest of the workers, lunch break. As for you Yaro, you can take off for the next shift. As the workers were eating lunch, Sai approached Naruto. The man sure is losing a lot of workers fast, that's been two this morning, Sai said. Naruto knew what he was hinting at, he sighed. I'll approach him after the lunch break is over about using my shadow clones, Naruto said. And indeed 15 minutes later. Just after Tazana had ordered the workers back to their stations. You seem to be losing a lot of workers Tazana, Naruto said, working him into the subject. Yeah, well not many are willing to risk the lives of what families they have especially if there are women or children in those families, Tazana knew the reasons why so many had quit. What would your reaction be if I said I was able to fix the problem and give you all the workers you need? I would beg you on my hands and knees if necessary to get you to do so, Tazana obviously thought that Naruto was joking. That won't be necessary. Mass Shadow Clone Technique. A wall of smoke appeared in front of the two, obscuring their view of the workers. And as the smoke cleared, Tazana's jaw fell open at the sight of 75 clones of Naruto staring back at him. All right, follow whatever Tazana tells you to do, okay? Naruto said to his clones, sure boss. They chanted back. Tazana grinned, all right, we need teams carrying materials from over at the supply station to the bridge. We also need teams at the supply station cutting bricks from the stone there that sort of thing. Is it possible to get a team under the bridge looking for cracks? Tazana's voice faded away as Naruto walked back to where he had been sitting before. That night, Tazana's house. Tazana was talking with Kanako about what had happened this morning over dinner. He created a small army of workers for me to work with. If he can continue doing so, I could have that bridge finished in three to four weeks instead of something like two months. Although with Gato out of the way it will be a lot easier as a lot more people will join in. Killer B and Yugito shared a glance when they heard of Naruto's feat, there were very few people with such a large amount of chakra to be able to do something like that, and first amongst the category were Jinka Arikis. Naruto and Sai saw the glance and knew that Naruto would be confronted by the two soon. Why don't you leave? You're all going to die anyway. Inari, Tsunami's son said loudly from the far end of the table. Because Gato couldn't kill us if he tried, Naruto said in a low voice in the sudden silence. Gato will kill you all. You aren't able to stop him. You don't know how hard life has been for the people in this village. You don't know how difficult life can be. Inari shouted. Naruto, Killer B, and Yugito stiffened. Kanako's, Kurinai's and Sai's eyes all widened at the audacity of this kid. Naruto leaned towards Inari before growling in a grating tone. You have no idea what pain is. He then stood up silently, put his hood over his head, obscuring most of his face before opening the door and walking out of the house. Ignoring the cries of Hinata and Nino, Kanako turned to Inari. Never say that Naruto doesn't know pain. He grew up with no one there to help him, he was hated by every person in our village, apart from seven or eight who couldn't help him. For the first eight years of his life he was beaten by huge mobs that tried to kill him or drive him insane, whichever came first. At the age of four he was literally thrown out of the orphanage from the top story, and after that he lived off the streets for two years before the Hokage was able to track him down. Several times he was pronounced clinically dead by doctors in the hospital, causing the villagers to start celebrating before he came back to life. Even in the hospital people tried to kill him, to the point where only two or three doctors could be trusted to look after him. By the time he was five he had survived over 800 assassination attempts on his life. In the end he developed multiple personalities to try and deal with it. Thankfully over the years he has been able to recover although he still shows hints of those personalities when he gets angry or sad. Kanako said by way of an explanation as to why Naruto was angered by the suggestion that he didn't know pain. Killer B and Yugito looked at one another again. This time it was certain, Naruto was a Jinchuriki, as only Jinkarikis are treated with so much hate. During the silence that pervaded at the table, they could all hear the sounds of a violin in the night. Kanako sighed again. When he gets sad, Naruto tends to either disappear for a while, or retreat to the highest place available and play his violin. Kakano said as she looked up at the ceiling. Naruto sighed heavily as he played the final note on his violin. He knew that he would be slightly slow in the morning, he was just wearing just his shirt, leaving his vest in the house when he walked out. And it was late in the night, perhaps even early morning. He resealed his violin before creeping silently off the roof of Tazuna's house. It wouldn't do to worry his friends unnecessarily. The next morning dawned with frost covering the ground and Yugito awoke groggily before grumbling slightly and turning over in her sleeping bag reluctant to leave the heat surrounding her. Eventually giving up on her getting back to sleep, 
Yugi Ito instead thought upon the most recent subject on her mind, Naruto. He seemed to be very strong, as Killer B had commented that even he was unsure he would be able to beat Naruto, and Killer B was the strongest person she knew, apart from perhaps the Rakage. He also seemed to be emotionally conflicted due to his past as a Jinchuriki, although his seemed to be extreme compared to even B's. However he also seemed to be a very kind person, perhaps too much so, Yugi Ito reflected thinking back to their spar when he almost fell for her trick. It was unusual, one would expect someone with such a past to be cold and closed off to other people, considering the mission before their friends. Yugito's eyes widened when she realized that Samui was awake and watching her silently, almost as if she knew what Yugito was thinking. However both their attention was caught when they saw that B's sleeping bag was empty. They awoke Amoe and Kurun strapped their equipment on hurriedly, it was odd for B not to notify them when he left so they were worried. Naruto and B were silent as they created a mindscape connection between their two as the two had agreed that B and Gyuki, the Eight Tails, would teach Kyare how to fully be able to help Naruto with her chakra. But in exchange Naruto would have to show B memories of his past, before he began his training with his Nei-chans and Nei-sans, along with promise that he would sometime come to Kumo in order to fully train with Kyare to control her power, as she could only do so much. Naruto had readily agreed. As due to his Uzumaki chakra he had an estimated lifespan of around 150 years, although his was more like 200 due to also being Kyari's Jinchuriki. As they connected their mindscapes, both ninja felt their eyelids being dragged down. A few minutes later Yugi Ito, Samui, Kuruna Moe came upon the scene of the two looking like they were sleeping with their right hands on the forehead of the other. Immediately Kuro stormed towards the two, determined to stop Naruto from whatever he was doing, before Yugi Ito stopped her from interfering. Leave them we shouldn't interrupt. Instead we should watch over the two and make sure others do not interrupt, Yugito said authoritatively. But he is obviously doing something to B-sensei, Kuro objected, surprised that Yugito had stopped her. No, B-sensei chose to initiate this, as he is the only person able to do such a thing. He did the same for me when I was younger, Yugito explained after she sat down on a nearby log. Surely you don't mean that? Samui asked uncertainly, as it seemed that Yugito was suggesting that Naruto was a Jinchuriki. Although that would explain how he could keep throwing out high-level jets as long after most would have collapsed. We have our theories but we can't confirm them, it may simply be because he's an Uzumaki. Within the Mindscape connection, Naruto whistled softly as he looked around within the connection. The setting seemed to be a place in the Land of Lightning, due to the mountains and valleys, with mountains going off into the distance. Sorry if it seems a bit unfamiliar, Naruto turned to see two men, one was B and the other was obviously the Eight Tails, due to his appearance. Our mind unconsciously selected this place, as this is where we spend most of our time. It was only by becoming a Jian and Sensei that we were able to actually leave Kumo, and even then rarely, be explained patiently, as although he understood his brother's reasons, it did get very boring, right? Naruto said briefly before turning to the Eight Tails, it is a pleasure to meet another of the Baijuu, being as misunderstood as they are. I shall say the same, Uzumaki Naruto, as I can tell that you are descended from the blood of my father, you have the same bearing. Although you are a Uzumaki, Gyuki said courteously, confusing both B and Naruto. What do you mean, descended from your father? Naruto asked curiously. I thought that she would have told you, Gyuki said, pointing past Naruto, although I do not recognize the second woman. All three of them turned to see Kyare and Kushina, who were walking towards them at a steady pace. It has been a very long time since I last saw you Kyare Nechan, Gyuki said rather jovially. Indeed it has, Atoto. How has it been in the Land of Lightning? I haven't visited in a while, Kyare seemed almost uncertain, although that may have been because of the questioning glare being sent her way by Naruto. What does Kyuki mean, the blood of his father? Naruto repeated the question to Kyare, who winced before shooting a slight glare at the human form of the Eight Tails and sighing. Naruto, his father and the father of all the Baijuu, was a person known to humans as the Rikadu Senin. Although he had us as his children essentially at the end of his life, he had three male human children before then. We were different because we were created from the chakra of the Juubi, while his former children were normal, but each inheriting specific traits from him. However at the end of his life he had to choose an heir from one of his three sons. But at the time he was delirious, so he passed the duty on to his eldest, which was, unfortunately, me. So it became my duty to watch over the families of the three sons and judge which is worthy to be proclaimed the heirs of the Rikadu Senin himself. The three sons were very different on their outlooks in life. The eldest liked a life of prestige, but helped others to the point where it became renown. The second son loved a life of both prestige and combat, although soon his arrogance reigned over both his desires. The youngest son however, 
instead was more adventurous, gathering whatever knowledge he could, and decided that he would use it for good or ill, depending on the circumstances of the time. As you may have guessed, these three sons of the Rikadu Senin were the forefathers of the Sanju, Uchiha and Uzumaki clans respectively. Each was granted a physical trait of their father, Senju gaining the body, Uchiha gaining a version of the eye, as the man had deemed it too dangerous for them to wield, and the Uzumaki gaining the thirst for knowledge and longevity of life. After that the three brothers split up, each searching for their own goal, and eventually founded clans across the elemental nations. However the Uchiha, still remembering that his father had given him a weaker version of his trait, renounced family bonds and raised his clan to be the rival of the Sanju, as he disregarded the Uzumaki to be nothing more than old wise men who would prove easy to kill. Thus both the Senju and Uchiha clans forgot their brotherly connections and fought on many a battlefield. Meanwhile the Uzumaki focused more on themselves, creating the first hidden village in Uzushiogakur and using their knowledge to slowly train themselves in the shinobi arts, gaining an understanding of chakra that rivaled that of the Rikadu Senin. As such the bonds that held two of the clans together fragmented, while the bonds of the Senju and Uzumaki weakened, as the Uzumaki just watched as the Uchiha attacked. Thus they grew with the Uchiha perfecting versions of ninjutsu and taijutsu but also relying heavily on their sharingans, while the senju focused more on ninjutsu, medical ninjutsu, and genjutsu, although their taijutsu rivaled that of the Uchiha. The Uzumaki however took a different path, taking the arts of fuu and jutsu and kenjutsu beyond what the others thought possible, being able to beat both of the former clan's greatest abilities easily. As such both the senju and Uchiha left the Uzumaki relatively alone, knowing that to attempt war was foolish, especially as they were fighting each other, Kyare said, losing B, Kushina and especially Naruto. As to who this is Gyuki, she continued, motioning to Kushina, this is Naruto mother. Well it seems the abilities of the Uzumaki have not fallen, if they are able to seal a person into another, Gyuki said, unknowing of the loss of Ozushio. Perhaps not, but Naruto is the only known Uzumaki left alive. The rest fell fighting Iwa and Kumo when they invaded. They were overwhelmed by sheer numbers, Kushina said, having returned to the conversation once Kyuki spoke. So it seems that the numbers of the three clans have been scoured. The sword that existed now lies shattered and peace has been lost to the world. After the Senju and Uchiha killed each other off, only the Uzumaki were left to restore peace to the world, but it seems they were destroyed as well, Gyuki said, eyes dulling slightly. All is not lost, as the containers of the recent generation have much promise, judging from what I have seen from B and Yugito, along with Naruto, Kyara said, grasping his shoulder. Alas, we are the lucky ones. B's brother, A, occasionally receives reports which include the status of the other Jinshuriki. Isabu went missing after his container was killed at the conclusion of the recent bloodline purge. We know that Son Goku and Kokuo are held by Iwa, and that their Jinkarikis are treated like outcasts by the village, so they spend a large amount of their time outside of its walls. Seiken's Jinshuriki recently became a missing nin after leaving Kiri at the height of the purge, and Chome's Jinshuriki although not liked by her village of Takigakur, still retains an attitude similar to that of Naruto's mask. But it is likely that once again it is a mask of her true feelings. The most startling reports are that of Shukaku's Jinshuriki, as it seems that Shukaku himself has drastically changed. They say that Shukaku tortures his container, never allowing him to sleep and constantly demanding that blood be spilled. The container itself is being raised as a weapon, and is feared by his own family, Gyuki said his voice never changing in pitch. Well it seems that it is time for the Jinchuriki and the Baiju to gather once more, for to combat Kurai we will need all of the Jinchuriki to work together, or we shall be picked off one by one. Kyare gained a fire in her eyes as she looked at Gyuki's fallen hope. B, as Naruto and I are unable to do much on our end, would you be able to keep tabs on the Jinchuriki? Kyare asked, turning to the quiet man. Sure, Gyuki and I shall handle that. Although Shukaku's container seems to be scheduled to attend the Chunin exams in Konoha in a few months' time, be outlined, knowing that this was not the time to wrap. Good, then that means that Naruto and I will be able to see if we can fix whatever seems to have changed with Shukaku. Kyara sensed that the time would be coming soon, the time where the choices they made would decide the fate of the elemental nations. The two of them woke from their connection, after discussing several other matters with Kyare and Yuki, who seemed to hearten upon hearing of his older sister's plan. It had been far too long since he had seen the others. Naruto and B saw that the Kumo team had watched over the two of them as they had talked with their Baiju, and as he sat up slowly, he knew that it was likely they suspected he was a Jinchuriki, but he also knew that until he stated it, they wouldn't press it. That was one thing he liked about the Kumo Shinobi, they weren't as pushy as several Konoha Shinobi were. That's the end guys if you enjoyed then make sure to leave a comment this is Chaos Shinobi signing off.